there is water uh, at the side of the, uh, at the hall. Could I just ask members both uh, within the room and also members of the public um, in the room and outside online, uh, if you could turn any mobile phones off or turn them to silent just so they don't uh, interrupt the proceedings of the meeting. Uh, just also a few uh, notes as to how the meeting will operate today. Um, just again to remind you, this is a hybrid meeting. Uh, we have the committee members of the development committee in the room here today at the canal side. Uh, and but there are also members and officers taking place through the team system joining us online. Uh, only councillors who are actually present within the room are able to vote on the applications today. I would also just remind you that this meeting is being recorded. Uh, the format of the meeting will be as per our agenda, which and a published copy of the officer presentations can also be found on the council website. Uh, each application will take in turn if the officers will outline the application, there'll then be public speaking when members of the public have registered to speak. And then members will debate and decide the applications. Again, just a reminder to, to members in the room, uh, you do have microphones that will be passed to amongst you to, uh, to speak. Please wait until you've got a microphone before you speak, uh, because otherwise those who are joining us online cannot hear what you're saying. And also just a reminder, of please don't turn the microphones off they are controlled from the rear of the room. You don't need to do anything to them other than just uh, if you can hold them up just so that, that, that you can be seen as to who is about to speak uh, and then we will we'll enable the microphone and you can then go ahead. Um, during the debate, there will be a poser and seconder uh, to a, for a resolution. Members will then vote on that. And again, just a reminder that only members who are in the room and have been present throughout the debate are able to vote uh, and they will like to vote for, against or abstain. Uh, the votes will then be counted and we'll announce what the result is. Um, just so you're aware of who's uh, with us today at the meeting, to my right uh, is uh, our committee manager, uh, who is here to make sure the meeting is carried out in a proper manner. Uh, we're joined online by uh, our members of our legal team to make sure we've got legal advice. To my left are officers uh, from the planning section who will be presenting the application today. That brings us, I think, members to the, uh, the agenda itself. Uh, item one is apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies? We have no apologies. Thank you very much. Uh, urgent business is item two on the agenda. I'm not aware of any business that is urgent that isn't already covered on our agenda. Item three is public speaking time. Uh, for members of the public, for those of you who registered to speak today, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we'll take each application in turn, we'll hear the presentation of the officers, and then I'll ask you to uh, address the committee. For those of you who are in the room with us, we'll ask you to come to the speaker's table. And for those who are joining us uh, virtually, we'll ask you to enable your microphone, just confirm that we can hear you, and then you can address the committee. In both cases, just to remind you that you do have three minutes to do so. Those of you who are in the room will see we have a clock which will count the time down. For those of you who are joining us uh, virtually, I think you can probably just about see the clock on the, uh, on the on the screen. However, we will just give you a one minute warning uh, when when the uh, time is getting close. So I will interrupt you shortly um, at that time and, and let you know that you've got one minute to go. Item four on the agenda is declarations of interest. Members, are there any declarations that members have today? We'll start with Councillor Granter. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Yes, uh, page six, page 24, as a member of the Wharton Town Council, just a personal interest in that. No discussions has taken place. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Chairman. Yep, the same for me. Pages six and 24, member of Bridgewater Town Council, personal interest. Thank you. And if you could pass it to Councillor Haywood. Thank you. That's the same reason uh, as a member of the Town Council. Um, pages 6 and 24, and I've had no discussion with it. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Um, yes, um, items on 15, page 15 and 31, and the ward member, I've taken no part in any discussion. Thank you. Moving around to Councillor Revens. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Page 37, as ward member and member of North Pelleton Town Council, I've taken part in no discussion. Thank you. Councillor Kingham. 
Yeah, I think you probably take care of that. Remember, it's very important. Yeah. Yeah. Any others on that side? No, uh, and I've also got a couple of declarations on pages uh, 15 and 31. Uh, they're within my county division. But again, like, uh, like Councillor Scott took no part in any of the discussions on those uh, and left the rooms when they were up for debate. And again, just as it has been highlighted, for those members who are members of the drainage board, we will also record a declaration that, unless you tell us differently, that you've been not involved in any of the discussions that the drainage boards have had on any planning applications. Okay, uh, just if I could ask uh, for, for members of the public who are joining us online, if it's possible that you could turn off your cameras until we get to the point of you addressing the committee, uh, it just helps us with the, uh, the the sort of bandwidth and avoids any uh, loss of connection. That would be helpful. Okay, thank you very much. So at that point, we move on to the uh, the planning applications themselves. Uh, the first application we have before us is on uh, page six. Uh, we are within Broadway Bridgewater. And if I could ask uh, the officers to present this, please, if you'd like to introduce it. Thank you very much. Uh, Shanta online, sorry. Shanta, sorry. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning. Uh, this application was deferred from last committee. It's, uh, it's an application for a detached coffee shop with a drive through lane and associated works. Um, it was deferred from last committee in order to provide members with further information regarding the likely traffic generation, waste and general business model. The agent has provided further information and reiterated information that was included within the submitted application. At the beginning of the report, there is a summary of the agent's points which cover traffic generation, air quality, sustainability, waste management, antisocial behaviour and retail impact. And also in terms of updating the report, um, Councillor Smedley's comments were reported verbally to members at the last committee and they should be within the print this report how they are moving. Um, however, for a reminder to members, Councillor Smedley agreed with the Town Council in terms of pollution and raises concern regarding queues of traffic, that it would encourage inappropriate and unnecessary car use, an increase of litter and that there are plenty of good local independent coffee shops in the town centre. The Environmental Health Officer um, has also uh, commented subsequent to last committee that they have no objection and they do not consider that the development would result in an increase in air pollutant levels so as to result in any exceedances of national air quality objectives. They do recommend, however, conditions regarding hours of operation and noise levels. So uh, to run through the application again to remind members, the site is located on the corner of Broadway and Taunton Road. Currently, it forms part of uh, the Morrison supermarket, which is on the corner. The access is off Broadway, um, which also leads to the B&M store to the west and winds around towards the petrol filling station and then into the car park. And that indicates the access, which is directly off Broadway and comes through past the filling station to the car park. Um, this is an aerial view of the same. And the location of the drive through cafe facility is in the top corner here. And a more detailed view of the proposed building, the access and route around the building together with a parking arrangement. There would be 23 car parking spaces, which include some cycle and motorcycle parking. The pedestrian walkway that currently links into the car park and to the store from Broadway is to be retained and included within the site. The building would measure 21 metres by 15 metres. It stands at a height of four metres to the main part of the roof and seven metres to the top of the Starbucks feature on the top of the roof there. It would be finished in vertical timber cladding. This is a this is a view of the site from the east at the traffic light junction. 
and still from the east, but looking towards Taunton Road. And this view is south, looking southwards, which is along the pedestrian path that runs along the eastern side of Morrison's car park. And from within the car park, looking at the site towards the corner there, so it would be sited in this area. And then from the same position, <clears throat> looking along the northern part of the car park. Returning to the site layout, um, in terms of updating the agenda, um, we've covered the Environmental Health Office's views and that Councillor Smedley's comments were submitted and updated verbally to members at the last committee. And um, the agent has provided additional information which is printed or summarised at the front of this report. But the recommendation is, as previously, with the two additional conditions that the Environmental Health Officer has suggested, the recommendation is to grant consent. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. As you'll see, we have a, a speaker registered. Uh, I've been advised that, unfortunately, uh, Mr Thomas wasn't, isn't able to make it, but he has uh, sent a substitute. So we have uh, Michael Powell, who is joining us, I believe. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you again. Just to remind you, you've got the three minutes and I will just briefly interrupt you when there's a minute of that time left to go. So start when you're ready. OK, thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and, and thank you, members, um, for the opportunity to speak again. Um, so uh, as was um, indicated by the, the planning officer, um, we've since provided um, an update sheet to highlight and locate the information that was discussed by members and submitted with the original application. So in particular, we noted members' comments about waste management and antisocial behaviour. Um, on waste management, this will be undertaken by contractors uh, and customers will be responsible for their own litter should they bring it off site with them as with any other use. Morrisons also operate a litter picking regime on their sites, so there will in effect be two parties controlling the management of litter. For antisocial behaviour, uh, we confirm that the existing car park is camera controlled with a maximum stay of three hours. Morrisons have systems in place for dealing with any antisocial behaviour in their car parks through liaison with the local community, local police, um, through to instigating additional security and restrictive access measures to prevent such behaviour persisting. We've heard that uh, an air quality um, report was submitted. Now that was raised as a particular concern by members at the last committee. So whilst the site's not in an air quality management area, the applicant nonetheless commissioned an air quality assessment to be prepared um, and it confirms that the proposed development's not predicted to result in a traffic increase above relevant criteria. There won't be any significant effects on air quality. So in essence, there are no concerns over air quality. Since the application was discussed at the last committee, We've taken on board all comments and sought to address these through directing members to the accompanying and supporting information that responds to the matters raised at the last committee. All technical reports have been prepared by the necessary qualified specialists to which the Council's consultees have all raised no objections. So we very much hope that you'll take these points into account in your decision to approve this application. Thank you very much. Thank you. Members, any comments or questions, please? Yes, we'll start with Councillor Haywood. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to point out a slight inaccuracy in the statement because it says um, that Morrison's car park is currently um, subject to antisocial behaviour. That's not the case. And that was the whole point that I made last time is that it's quite likely that with, with a new Starbucks there, that it will become a place for people to con congregate in the future. Um, having experienced this both at uh, um, Sainsbury's car park and, um, and, and at McDonald's. I'm sorry, I'm just looking for the place on the, in the, the note. Um, the other point I'd like to make too is that because Morrison's car park is privately owned, the police are reluctant to get involved. We, we've found this in um, at Sainsbury's car park when we, we try to restrict um, access there, the police just don't want to get involved. So it's very much um, uh, down to Morrison's. Um, 
I note that it's due to be open until 11 p.m. So between 8 and 11 is three hours. So anyone coming after 8 o'clock uh, is subject to the rules that Morrison's apply, in other words, three hours. Um, so I still have real concerns that this will be, uh, <coughs> this development will create an issue that we don't currently have. Thank you. I have Councillor Pearce and then Councillor Hendry. So, Councillor Pearce. Um, it's the drive through element of this application that, that really bothers me. The, the very nature of it, the business model of it, supports engine idling and it does support the generation of disposable cups and what have you. And therefore, it is inevitable that it will create an increase in litter, whether it be on this site or whether it be somebody flinging their cup out of the, uh, the car door when they're on their way home. So it's, those are the two elements which I find hard to understand how this can come to committee uh, when it seems to be opposed to um, policy D24 in particular on, um, on carbon emissions. Uh, in terms of litter, um, yes, it's true that the, the car parking site, I've, I've never noticed any sort of uh, particular litter problem on site, but if you walk along Hamp Ward pathway, well, there was a photograph of it earlier, but it didn't catch that within the hedge, there is lots of litter that's trapped within the hedge that nobody seems to, uh, uh, to collect, uh, tidy up, and it's, it's a running saw uh, within the area. So I... Uh, I remained have deep concerns about this application in this location. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think Ms Noon, you wanted to comment and I'll come to Ms Parsons if there's anything she wants to say. Mr Noon. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think we need to sort of, you know, just be aware that we were, where we need to strike the balance between the material considerations of the application and the fear of what may happen or as a result of um, the use of this the, 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 this coffee shop drive-through should it happen. Um, the fear of antisocial behaviour is always one we would sort of warn members against assuming will happen. Um, we can't say that coffee drinkers will, you know, with any certainty, will misbehave in the car park. It is private land. There will, it is obviously in the interest of the supermarket to control the situation there because they will, they'll only end up with conflicts between users. Um, so I think clearly that, that that is the matter that they would want to control. Again, with littering and the fact that people might let their car idle, that's a sort of fear of the way people might behave. Um, it, you know, there's, there's no reason to assume that they would do that. There's no reason to assume people would, for example, with electric cars wouldn't use this facility. So I think we are in danger. I think some of these concerns are about the way users would behave. And I think I would just sort of raise a hand there and say, well, you know, is that a material planning consideration? Miss Parsons, is there anything you want to add at this point? Um, yes, please. Um, I just wanted to clarify that while the proposal was initially for opening hours till 11 o'clock, 11 p.m. Um, the environmental health officer recommends, and that's that the within the report, the front of the report, as well as at condition number four, recommend to control the opening hours to those of the store, um, other than Sunday. So to um, close at 10 o'clock at night. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Uh, I have Councillor Hendry, and then Councillor Grimes next, and then Councillor Revens. So Councillor Hendry. Good morning, Chairman, Councillors. I voted in favour of this the last time round, and I stand by that wholeheartedly. Nothing's changed in my opinion. Well, for my opinion. There are several points that have to be addressed. I, the, the one just hypothetically, if you had people throwing paper cups out of the window, etc., you could say that about McDonald's. Now, I know I compared it to McDonald's the last time, but that's the only, the only model I have to go by. There's a traffic lights right next door to McDonald's on the corner, very, very similar to this. This one here is in a private car park, uh, so it doesn't interfere with highways in any way. The Southwest Heritage is okay, rights of way is okay, ecology is okay, everything's fine with that. Uh, on the representations, drive through not needed. 
well, that may be one person's opinion, but that doesn't, that's not a blanket ban over everybody. If some people want to drive through again at McDonald's, that's their choice. There's plenty of wonderful coffee shops in the town, I'm sure there is, but people would still have to drive there, still have to park their cars, and if they go to any takeaway food shops like fish and chips or pizzas, they're still going to walk away with their own wrappings and their own cardboard boxes or polystyrene. Once they leave the premises, it's down to them. It's not down to the coffee shop owners. So it's an unfair appraisal to say that they're going to throw cups out of the windows or do anything. It's, it's the owner's responsibility once they actually leave the place. I should not encourage more traffic onto the streets, increasing noise and air pollution. Well, if you're going to a coffee shop in the town, what's the difference? You're still going to drive there, you're still going to have noise and air pollution, etc. because that's the way it is. One, one drives to one, you drive to the other. The outdoor seating is an unpleasant and unhealthy place being next to traffic lights. If you have a coffee shop in a town where they have outdoor seating in Bridgewater, and they have, I've been to them, uh, what is the difference between sat there, to me, to me sat outside this new premises? The, the objections simply don't stack up for me at all. I'm in favour of this. I was the last time. I am now. It's no different to McDonald's down beside um, Sainsbury's, etc. On that basis and everything I've said, I'm happy to bring forward the case officer's recommendation to grant permission. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Councillor Grimes and Councillor Revan, so Councillor Grimes. Not yet. Try again. How's that? That's, what That's better. Thank you. Um, yes, I also agree with Councillor Hendry. Having listened to the debate, I have no problem as all the re relevant points have been addressed. And as such, I'm happy to second the recommendation. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Revan. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, just a couple of points from me. On policy D24, um, it doesn't, I can't see any reference to an air quality management area. Um, can we just clarify whether that is a limiting factor on, on doing an, an air quality report? Um, certainly, if you spend any time there, I wouldn't describe the air quality as good, um, just from breathing there. Um, but I appreciate I'm, I'm breathing doesn't make one an expert in air quality. Um, and secondly, I, we also raised concerns about policy D18 at the last meeting around the impact on the town centre. Um, can I just have clarity that um, whether this is in the, 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 the primary shopping areas defined by the planning map, I can't find that map on the on the local plan. And if not, are, are we satisfied that there will be no harm to the retail hierarchy of the primary shopping area? And I remain surprised that there's no significant impact on air quality um, of a drive through. Um, I th would assume that the business model of a drive through was that people would drive through it and their engines would be running and that would reduce air quality. Um, so either it's not economically viable or there is an air quality impact. You can't have it both ways. Thank you. Ms Parsons, are you able to address those two questions relating to air quality and the town centre impact? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I mean, if you if you have a look at the information that's being provided by the agent within the application and um, summarised um, at the beginning of the report, the subsequent to the last um, committee meeting, the um, agent had provided an air quality note prepared by Delta Simons um, and that confirms that the the development after it's constructed um, that the residual effects of the proposed development are considered not to be significant for all pollutants considered and as such additional mitigation is not required um, and in, ter in terms of traffic generation they the transport statement submitted with the application that accompanied accompanied it identified that 40% of the coffee shop's customers will be customers who are making a visit to the Morrison store. 40% will be from customers already on the highway network passing by. 20% are expected to be from new customers making specific journeys to the store. And with this 20%, the, the County Highway Authority had no objection to the application. And in terms of pollution and air quality, the the um, environmental health officers have not raised any concerns regarding the pollutants. Um, in terms of the impact on the town centre, 
um, the agents did look at sequential test and looked at various sites within Bridgewater Town Centre. And due to the model for this type of development, there was none that was identified that would meet um, meet meet their um, business model. And therefore this this was concluded to be an ideal site for their for their in, intentions. Um, I'm not sure that covers everything. Adrian, is there anything else that could Just be covered? Uh, yes, just just really to confirm that yeah, this isn't a designated air quality zone, monitoring zone. So from that point of view, we're not got we do not have a, a statutory duty to sort of consider these impacts and uh, you know make the situation better. Uh, that much said, that doesn't mean we ignore the air quality implications. But as the applicant has um, set out in their supporting case, most of the vast majority of the car trips that would come here are already on the road, either passing by or coming to the supermarket or probably using the petrol station as well. And that, yes, it is accepted that there will be a small proportion that do come here solely for the uh, to visit the coffee shop. But as has been sort of commented, they are all probably already on the road. Um, in terms, Shanta, are you just able to just confirm where we are with regard to town centre designation? Oh, yes, sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's not within the, um, forgotten the phrase, primary shopping centre. Right, OK, thank you. I mean, we are dealing with an, out, an edge of town centre retail location. That's already been agreed. We've got a number of retail outlets here. It is not considered that the addition of a drive through coffee shop upsets the retail hierarchy in terms of the town centre uses that we would normally expect to go into the town centre. We are looking at an established edge of town centre uh, location and it's not a, such a significant increase in ac retail activities here that it uh, offends policy. I think it was D18. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Councillor Granter. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Just before we vote on this application, just a query really regarding the local labour agreement. It does state on here, it is estimated that the proposal will create 15 full-time employment positions, which is welcome, which are likely to be drawn from the local area. Well, I don't understand that where, where it's likely to be drawn, not it will be drawn from the local area, if we're talking about a local agreement, labour agreement. And I just wanted that clarified, please, to make sure to, that we have that to work in, 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 in this specific uh, application. Thank you. OK, Miss Parsons or Mr Noon, who wants to? I think Mr Noon, OK. This this isn't the scale of development that we would, you know, it's one coffee shop. We wouldn't normally seek to impose a local labour agreement on a development of this scale. The reality of the nature of the job, the shift work, um, the sort of the, the skill levels there will be obviously you know there'll be a store manager there will be baristas there will be that sort of thing i think it is reasonable to assume that those jobs will be taken locally um i think the opportunities there are, are really going to be local the you know, it's unlikely that people are going to commute great distances to this to, to these types of jobs um i think we need to be sort of you know clear about what type of job this is going to offer um i see no reason to assume that they are going to go to recruit outside of the town for the majority of them. Thank you. I've got Councillor Revens and then Councillor Bolt. Councillor Revens. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, yeah, just, just looking at the policy on D18, um, so I think we're on the wider town centre area section and um, the council will support retail um, proposals that will not harm the vitality and viability of the primary shopping area. Um, to me, if there is this 20% of usage, which is not, not existing traffic, um, the question that, that, that's in my mind is that is that 20% existing customers of, of town centre facilities and therefore there is a harm to the primary shopping area. And my second point is, is that in terms of the air quality, if it is 20%, is 20% a significant increase? 
and one person significant is another person significant and therefore i think this is an area of judgment thank you thank you mr noon do you want to respond yeah i i, I would yes i would agree it's a matter of, of weight in the planning balance um i don't think we would regard a coffee shop just ignore the fact that it's a drive through but I don't think we would regard a coffee shop as a use that is only acceptable in the town centre. I think if a coffee shop was proposed in the uh, sort of more local centres or out uh, in, in, in Bridgewater more generally, I don't think we would be saying to them, no, you can't sort of locate out in a more residential area on the fringes of Bridgewater. You must have your coffee shops only in the town centre. So I think we do need to sort of look at what is the, the, the main use here it's a sort of cafe, for want of a better word. I don't think that is something that is inherently harmful outside of the town centres. As I said earlier, this is already an edge of town retail. There's a number of shops here of the big box variety that you tend to find on the edge of town centres. And I don't see that a coffee shop is inherently incompatible with this location. Yes, by virtue of the model drive-through, yes, there's an emphasis on carborn but we need to be able to say is this going to become such a draw for cars to come here that wouldn't come here normally bearing in mind the other retail supermarket and petrol filling stations at the site yes some will some will come but are they going to be in such numbers that a highway safety issue would result well the highway authority say no as you've got well controlled junctions um, there will also be a matter of choice. And in terms of air quality, we are not in an area where the air is so bad that this would result in such harm that in air quality terms, our environmental health officers tell us that we should be resisting this. Um, so from that point of view, yes, there are some more coming, but you need a clear identifiable harm uh, to those additional traffic movements that might now come to this site as a result of the proposed use and you need to identify a clear harm and there just isn't the technical support to say that that harm would be so manifest that a refusal is warranted thank you We've got councillor bolt thank you <clears throat> uh, two points one's on the um, noise monitoring uh, is that going to be set up on the, the, the sites? is that going to be set up on the closest site monitor it because it's, it's very specific on um, when measured or calculated the boundary of any noise sensitive dwelling that it should, should not exceed the prevailing background noise. How are we going to know the difference? Is it being monitored now so that we know what the background noise is to compare it? Mr. Noon, I think, or Mr. Parsons, I don't know who wants to take that. Yeah. Mr. Noon. Sure. Okay. I, I think that is a sort of fairly standard approach to the environmental health officers. It, it is reactive. So if someone complains that this the coffee shop is generating an undue level of noise, then that's why they've referred to the BS standard there. There is that is a standardized way of measuring this sort of complaint. It would typically, you know, sort of address if someone's got a defective and therefore noisy air conditioning unit, you can pick up that noise, you can measure that above the background. So it's it's quite as my understanding is it's a quite straightforward issue if a complaint is received for the environmental health officers with their noise measuring gear to go out and do a, a fairly structured test to dem, you know, to determine whether or not the noise that someone is complaining about is down to whatever you say it, it is. So it, it is there, it will be reactive. Thank you for that one. And the other one is more or less the same thing. Uh, am I taking from you that there is no um, air quality monitoring at all at that junction that we can compare an increase of uh, the lowering of the air quality. Other than that, you know, it, it can go quite dangerous and it will be blamed on the junction because we've got nothing to set it by. The air quality monitoring, um, I'm not an expert on, but my understanding is that as a council, we have a duty to be aware of any issues that crop up. And if there are hot spots where it could happen, we are, I, I, I believe, we are required to keep an eye on that. When it exceeds a certain level, the obligation falls on 
the local authority to put in place measures to cure it. Now, my understanding is we are not close to any such situation. That's the, at the statutory level. Um, but we, it is something that is monitored in the background. So we have something to set the standard at that junction? I believe so, but I couldn't, I couldn't guarantee in what format they are. There are our background work um, because we need, it's something we need to be aware of, particularly when local plans come around for adoption. We need to know if there's going to be an issue through, through the projected growth um, of the town. We need to know if it's going to be an air quality issue as a result of that. So, yes, there is background stuff going on. And it's from that point of view that we can say we aren't in an air quality management zone. So if there is an increase, or should I say a decrease in air quality, we'll be able to do that building. I don't think we'd ever be able to pin it on one particular user. These things tend to be traffic generated. It, it would be on the back of additional traffic. And there are probably lots of factors why growth in that junction in traffic might occur or, or even drop off. Um, if, we, if, if we don't have anything um, to compare it against in figure on the report, how will we know if, if they're transgressing anything? I think that comes through the sort of the, 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 the wider background knowledge. I think we, you know, it's something that we could, if there is a concern about you know, explaining this issue, I think we'd probably best to get environmental health officer just to provide an update on this issue. But for the purposes of current applications, we are not, we do not have an air quality monitoring zone here. And therefore, you know, this application is not flagged up as something that would result in such an impact on air quality that it is objectionable. Thank you. I've got Councillor Haywood and then we'll look to move to a vote. If someone could pass the microphone down to Councillor Haywood, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I just interested to point out that um, that officers are are using the argument, for example, um, that we that we should not use hypothetical um, thoughts um, to 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 guide our decision in in this process. But at the same time, a lot of the information that we're getting to support this application is also hypothetical. Uh, for example, a statement that only 20% will be new users. How do they know? They don't. This is hypothetical. It's what they'd like to, us to believe. But what if that number was 80%, not 20%? So they don't know, we don't know. So I just think that we should give where we have already have established businesses on car parks, which result in littering, uh, antisocial behavior and so on. It is quite likely on an understanding of what already has happened in town that this might happen again. So I'm just saying that we maybe should give equal weight to both hypothetical arguments. Thank you. Thank you. Do you okay, Mr. Noon, and then I'm, I'm going to move to a vote. Okay. Just wanted to, to, on that point, the, 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 the figures for people coming to this, this thing, those are provided by the applicant. That, that's their, their estimate of how things would pan out. I have no reason to doubt that their experience of operating similar facilities elsewhere, I've no reason to doubt that that would lead them to give us misleading figures or, or that these figures cannot be trusted. What the key point here is we have no evidence to say that is wrong. And if we're going down the route of sort of raising a concern on that, we would need to back up our case there to say why the operator who has vastly more experience of such things than I have or any of the other planning officers have, why are they wrong on their own figures? So I think, yeah, we, they're not hypothetical. They are the evidence of the applicant. And we're not saying that there's any indication that they should or could be disputed. Okay, thank you very much. Members, we have a proposal that was made by Councillor Hendry, seconded by Councillor Grimes, which was grant permission with, as I understand it, the additional conditions that were outlined in relation to environmental health which were highlighted by, by Ms. Parsons. Okay, so we have that recommendation to grant permission. Those in favour, please show. One, two, 
And those against, please show. And abstentions, please. Ah, thank you. So that is all members present have voted. So that is clearly carried. Uh, nine in favour, three against, and two abstentions. Permission is granted. Right, members, turn to the next application, please, with uh, speakers present, which is on page 15. Uh, we move to the parish of Badgeworth, and I think, Mr. Titchener, you're introducing this one. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, so uh, this is uh, an application for the change of use of uh, an existing dwelling uh, to a use as a children's home uh, for um, the young people. It's a property known as uh, uh, Burwell House in uh, Badgeworth. Uh, so just an aerial plan just to uh, get a sense of uh, the property's location. Uh, so the red line indicates uh, okay. where the property Can you is. Just pause for one moment. Uh, cool. We're not getting the plans up on the screen at the moment. Uh, is hang on. Let's just, okay. just... Are, are all are any members getting up on their screen, or is it just is it just me? No. Uh, uh, hang on. I think let's try. Maybe it's deactivated when Chan to start sharing. Now? Yes. yes. Right. Apologies. Um, OK, so uh, let's get back to the screen I was on. So yes, this is the aerial plan. Uh, so sh the red line here showing where the property is. So it's just uh, located to the south of uh, Badgeworth, sort of the main sort of part of Badgeworth is just up here. So it's a detached house with a detached garage. Um, it has uh, the nearest other residential properties. There is a uh, property here called Long Acre, uh, a farm, as I understand. And then we're about 175 metres to the north, um, uh, where there's sort of the, the built up edge of the village sort of starts, and then about a similar sort of distance over to the <coughs> east, where there's another group of uh, uh, what were once uh, council properties. Uh, so this is just the red line plan, uh, just showing the house in context. Um, so that's the property there. That's the um, d detached annex that currently exists uh, within which the uh, accommodation would uh, be provided. Uh, so again, just a more zoomed in version of that, showing the house uh, garage. The access, which we'll talk about uh, in due course, is, is existing and comes in at this location here to the parking area. Um, here. So just to um, do a few updates, um, because at the point that the report was uh, finalised, there was still a reconsultation going on. Um, so some further information had been received from the applicants about how they proposed to run, um, run the care home. And uh, so that was subject to consultation. And so this is just to update members on some additional comments that have been received since. So Badge of Parish Council, um, who had objected when uh, initially c consulted on the application, uh, state that they stand by their objection. Um, they maintain their concerns about parking. Uh, they recommend that members undertake a site visit. Um, they consider that the proposal will impact the local community and that 41 people have commented on the application. Uh, Chapel Allerton Parish Council also commented in the most recent uh, consultation. Um, they stated that they were uh, disappointed not to have been consulted on the application um, and that they shared concerns expressed locally and by other parishes about parking the, um, within the plots, about impact on on-street parking, on emergency vehicle access, horse boxes, lorries, and highway safety in general. Uh, some additional representations have been received from members of the public. So uh, again, expressing concerns about parking provision and on-street parking. Another uh, made comment about no environmental impact assessment has been provided or a quality act assessment to justify the use and state that no vehicular risk assessment had been submitted. Um, just by way of comment on some of those uh, points raised, um, disregard Chapel Allison's comment about not having been consulted on the application. Um, the proposal isn't in their parish 
it doesn't adjoin their parish, so there is no requirement that they should be consulted on, on, on the application, uh, the same as any other parish. Uh, um, in terms of the total number of comments received, that has gone up to 43 representations in total now. Those are, some of those are um, from repeat individuals. So if you break it down, it's a total of 22 individuals have commented. Some of them have commented twice because we've reconsulted on basing the, inf the additional information. So they've written in again. Um, so, uh, and of those 22, three provided comments, but 19 were maintaining an objection. Um, in terms of someone made a comment about environmental impact assessments, that's a very specific type of assessment that, that has to meet a certain threshold, uh, generally on very large scale developments. So this type of proposal wouldn't meet that threshold, so there would be no environmental impact assessments. And in terms of the highway impacts and the quality act uh, assessments, um, those are issues that I'll touch on in the presentation as we move forward. So these are the floor plans. Um, uh, provided. So ground floor of the property and the adjoining annex, and then the first floor of the property and first floor of the annex. So the property currently has six bed bedrooms spread across the house and the uh, converted uh, garage. Uh, so bedrooms uh, at first floor in the house and then some of the bedrooms at the ground floor in the annex. Uh, so the proposal would see that existing single family home sort of set up single planning unit changed to a children's uh, home um, it will house up to four children at any one time and those would be aged between nine and 18 years of age um, the property will be managed by live-in care staff uh, and they will work on a shift pattern uh, so there'll be two on-site uh, carers uh, at any one time and they will work a 48-hour shift so they will work uh, for two days uh, and then change over at 8 a.m. In, the, in the morning and then another at which point two other carers will take on and work for the next 48 hour period. There will also be a full time residential manager who will be there uh, working uh, sort of more typical office hours, nine to five. Uh, um, no external alterations are proposed to the building to facilitate the use. So essentially we are talking about the principle of the change and just assessing what the wider impacts. Uh, this photograph uh, of property, so this is Burwa House, just looking from, from the north down towards the junction, um, just to give some, some context along the road. Uh, so in terms of the principle of development, so what we're talking about is a change from the existing dwelling, uh, which it is to create this uh, care home. Uh, so. The relevant policies include policy D10-28, which regards healthcare facilities, and that does seek to direct most development towards Bridgewater and the designated settlements. Uh, however, rural proposals can be justified, uh, they need to be justified by the applicant. Um, in this case, they've provided uh, a, a number of supporting statements, which they've had to go into further detail, so as we've requested further information as part of the reconsultations, in order to set out their justification for the location. They have stated that they look for properties which are close to uh, open space so that the, the children that they house uh, would have access to outdoor space. Uh, they say that that will enable applicants to uh, have, uh, will enable the applicants to provide for a calming, therapeutic, and supportive environment for young people given its countryside location. Um, they state that that has been proven to be beneficial for children who, who perhaps have experienced things like trauma. Uh, the applicants already manage a number of rural care homes uh, uh, across the southwest, two of which are in our district, so they already operate some, uh, one that's near Chedsoy and East Huntsville. The proposal also has the support of Somerset County Council's Director of uh, Children's Services, Julian Booster. Um, a supporting letter from them has been uh, submitted as part of the application pack. Uh, that letter notes that at present 50% of the county's, <laughs> county's young person care placements have to be housed outside of the county due to a lack of provision. Um, and also just in terms of looking at the need and the fact that we did mention uh, a, a representation was mentioned, Equalities Act uh, and uh, age is a protected characteristic under the Equalities Act. We've had discussions about it. Uh, the public sector equality duty in previous committees. Um, the proposal would 
uh, provide additional provision for young people in care. Uh, so would be con considered beneficial when assessing against those protected characteristics under the Act, of which age is one of them, uh, as opposed to, on the flip side, say a proposal that might involve a loss of such provision, where you might have to, where you would have to assess the impact on those characteristics uh, from uh, the absence or loss of, of such a facility. In this case, it's providing additional, so that would be considered to be a beneficial uh, impact under the Act. Now, taking those factors into account. Uh, it's considered that there is sufficient justification uh, and need uh, for the principle of the change of use of this property to that uh, to a care home to be acceptable, notwithstanding the subsequent impacts we just want to go on and discuss. Uh, another closer up photo, just uh, looking in here, you can see the annex to the side uh, and, and the property uh, there as well. Uh, and again, uh, one looking up uh, here, you can see the access. Uh, um, so just uh, past uh, the junction, the access is sort of furthest from it, uh, and that leads into the parking area. And this is the uh, parking area uh, of the property. So this is the annex uh, here, or, and then this is the property here, and you pull into the, uh, the uh, parking spaces here. So there is um, parking has been one of the main areas of concern from uh, comments that we've received on the application. Um, most people have made uh, representations about that. So the site has um, um, proposed to make use of four off-road parking spaces. So effectively, there is two spaces that are provided by uh, being in tandem down the side of the garage and they're uh, leading out to here, and then two spaces effectively in front of what would have been the former garage doors before it was um, before it was uh, converted some years back. Uh, the proposal will make use of the existing uh, access, uh, which is across here. Uh, this is an access which was previously widened as part of earlier applications at the site uh, to improve its visibility uh, compared with the situation uh, going back some years. Um, so this is an image and text which is taken from the applicant's submission, uh, just to sort of broadly, um, uh, just because it's an aerial shot, just gives a bit more context to where the parking is supposed to be shown. So it does show the parking spaces, uh, the two um, a parallel sort of in tandem spaces, which would be along the side of the garage, and then the other two would be taken from here, um, immediately in front of the garage. So. Um, Four parking spaces. So we've had we've had an application previously. So when the garage was converted, parking was looked at at that point, and four parking spaces which was uh, noted as part of that application and considered as acceptable to serve the scale of a dwelling here, which would have been a six-bedroom dwelling at that point. Four spaces also should meet the operational requirements as a care home. So that's two spaces. Uh, each uh, two spaces for the uh, living carer, so one vehicle each, um, one space for the full time manager for the time they're there, and then there would also be one works vehicle that they would also have use of um, uh, for moving around, uh, for taking the children um, out. Uh, now, the change over times of the two living carers has been locally flagged as potentially uh, as an issue of concern in terms of that that could lead to parking uh, issues and highway safety issues. Now, as I stated, the carers will work two days on, four days off, changing over at 8 a.m. every day. The full-time manager is uh, understood to work normal office hours of nine to five, uh, so a slightly different pattern. Um, and in that case, the um, some of the changeover should have already happened by the time the full-time manager uh, attends the site. It's also worth noting the business model um, for, li for this type of operator uh, is that they, uh, their carers work much longer shifts than some other care facilities. So some care homes uh, would have uh, carers not living and would perhaps work an eight hour shift. Um, and uh, so it, the frequency of uh, changeovers is much greater with that type of model where um, the uh, changeover and staff might happen twice three times a day. Uh, the change, the frequency of the vehicle change over here is uh, only every uh, every other day. Uh, and that's the time where there, uh, any uh, potential impacts might occur. Um, the applicant states that they intend, you know, they're aware of the issue. You know, they manage other sites in rural areas. 
um, and, and will manage this uh, to um, uh, and make their staff aware of the need to reverse into the site, uh, to park tighter into the site on the morning of the handovers. Um, now, the, the Highway Authority has visited and they, uh, they, ha uh, they have undertaken a site visit on this one. They haven't given stand advice and they have commented in detail. Now, they consider that the type of development proposed would generate between six to eight vehicle movements per day. They note that there's no recorded injury collisions at, at the point of access to the site, uh, nor at the nearby junction of Badgeworth Lane or Quarrelands Lane. Um, and they consider that the visibility for the use proposed is acceptable. Um, they note that the site could be operated uh, uh, as a large family residence with multiple vehicles present uh, under the current arrangement. In their view, subject to the imposition of a condition requiring a detailed plan showing the laid out parking spaces, the Highway Authority raises no objection to the proposal. And whilst we do understand that concerns have been raised from residents uh, about parking, the proposal does put forward sufficient parking to meet the ongoing operational needs of the use. And in the absence of any Highway Authority objection, uh, we, uh, we would consider the proposal acceptable on highway grounds. Just want to touch on uh, amenity impacts, as I stated. Uh, there's one nearby property, which is uh, Long Acre here. The others are uh, over 175 metres away. Um, the environmental health team had requested imposition of a condition limiting all external amplified noise and submission of a noise management plan. Um, we had some concerns about that approach, uh, given the scale and nature of the use is not similar to operation as a family house. Um, and we wouldn't impose such conditions on a normal family house. Um, um, however, what we have proposed to do is just modify the condition uh, effectively to, um, just to require submission of a noise management plan effectively, um, just giving the operator the opportunity to provide some information to set out how they might deal with complaints uh, and that there's a point of contact, for example, in the uh, if there were issues to arise. Um, now, it should hopefully provide some comfort to address noise issues that notwithstanding, should they arise, and there's no ind indicator necessarily that this would give rise to any additional noise over above its use as a family home. Um, therefore, we consider the proposal on those grounds, uh, on amenity grounds, to be acceptable as well. So just to summarise, uh, we would consider, having taken account of, of, of the need and the justification put forward, that the change of use is acceptable, and notwithstanding local concerns that adequate parking has been provided to the satisfaction of the highway authority and there are no other matters which cannot be addressed by condition so we are recommending that permission is granted thank you thank you very much just before i come to the speakers um during the presentation it was mentioned of uh, social services involvement and, and mr worcester's comments uh, i've been advised that it's as well for county councillors to declare a personal interest because of the the mention of the county council potential involvement so I think Councillor Revens and, and myself are, are sitting county councillors and as such declare a personal interest on that basis. Right, so if we move to uh, our speakers list, the first speaker we have is Jackie Hitwell, who is speaking on behalf of Badgeworth Parish Council. Jackie, if you can just confirm your microphone is working okay? Uh, good morning, everyone. Absolutely, we can hear you well. So uh, again, you've got three minutes. I'll let you know when you've got one minute of that time left to go. So please start when you're ready. Um, thank you. As you know, both Bradford Parish Council objects to this application. The council recognises the needs of children's homes in the countryside, but feels very strongly that this location, the parking is not appropriate for the business proposed. We hope that the members have visited the site to understand its physical restrictions, and especially visibility on this stretch of road. The speed of traffic travelling along the straight road adjacent to the junction the proximity to the junction and the blind bend of the property. Despite a few accidents have been formally reported to the police and therefore registered with the highways, this site is notorious with the villagers, village residents who have few problems. The considerable number of responses to this application on this issue reinforces the extent of their concerns. The traffic at this location includes large farm vehicles and many adjacent farms. <clears throat> as well as commuting traffic for work and school, and horses and large vehicles from the numerous stables in this area 
as well as the daily movement of residents. Parked and waiting cars will create a hazard on this narrow road. It is difficult to understand how changeover will be achieved at this site without cars parking or waiting on the road. The nature of the business requires that children must be accompanied at all times. And despite the many comments, no solution or explanation has been offered that mitigates the need for cars to park or wait on the road as the changeover staff arrive. Vehicle movements are likely to be higher than the estimated eight movements as the use will include business and staff movements, as well as daily movements for children. Prior to the application process, Headway contacted the council and suggested other Headway properties are operating in the area. The parish council made some inquiries and was informed there were plenty of parking available in these other locations. We feel strongly that the parking arrangement at this location are simply not suitable for the proposed use. You have Finally, one minute to go. One minute to thank go. You. Finally, I'd add that the Parish Council have previously raised objections about vehicle parking in the case of previous planning applications. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, we have also registered to speak uh, Councillor Graham Godwin Pearson. Councillor Godwin Pearson, are you? You are with us. Excellent. Can you just confirm your microphone's working okay? Uh, I, I, I hope so. Can you hear me? Yep. We can hear you, that's excellent. So again, you've got three minutes, start whenever you're ready. Wonderful, thank you. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I was on the school run this morning an hour ago and you know, if there's one thing I've learned from having a child myself, it's the importance of um, community. You know, the sense of belonging that a child gets from being part of a school or a village. Uh, even those parents in remote farmhouses like Burwell House, you know, they regularly take their kids to the shops, to amenities, to other houses to build that sense of community in their children. And as children get older, this is even more important. You know, the sense of agency to slot into another into a local community is crucial in children's developments. And Burwell House is a lovely property and on the face of it as a property looks ideal, but it is cut off. It is cut off from villages. And if anybody has been to see that site, they will know that the roads outside are fast, they're dangerous, they're unlit, there are tractors, there are horse boxes, there are drivers going way too fast down that road. There are no pavements, there are no amenities within the local area, really. You've heard about parking, which is basically a giant game of Tetris in that property. I mean, to move the car at the back, you'd have to move the two in front of them out, you'd have a proper shuffle round. Uh, and members of staff arriving by car or leaving will, will, you know, they'll find those changeovers very difficult. That's just a fact, especially when the weather conditions are poor. I appreciate the County Council's need for more homes for children in care, but all things considered, I'd have thought there are many properties locally that are much better suited for their intent for this intended purpose. Both Badgeworth and Chapel at Alton Parish Councils, as you know, have expressed their concerns. And it's not as if they don't want a facility like this in the parishes. A site closer to one of the village centres would, you know, that would help to build that sense of community in the children. But this proposed site is just too remote and the road outside is too dangerous. The parking just doesn't work. And for those reasons, I there call... There is one minute to go, to Graham, one minute. Thank you. For those reasons, I call on the committee to reject this application in favour of a, a better site in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our first speaker we have is uh, Tim Corbyn, who is speaking on behalf of the applicants. So, Mr Corbyn, again, could you just make sure we can hear you? Yep, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. So again, just to remind you, you've got the three minutes and I, unfortunately, I'll have to interrupt you when there's a minute to go, but but please bear with us. For, we'll let you know when that time is ready. So please start when you're ready. No, thanks. I'd have, uh, also like to be in person, but unfortunately I've uh, got a positive COVID test on Sunday, but uh, not not sort of too many symptoms, just a bit bunged up. So obviously I didn't want to, wouldn't uh, come to the meeting. Um, so I'm here on Teams um, instead. So, uh, Obviously, we've got the concerns about parking. I'll do that in the second part. Just sort of as a as a brief history to Headway, we've six homes. Um, the last nine years, we've opened um, three homes, all in the local area. Like Jackie said, she's spoken or uh, they've reached out to the parish councils locally, Chedsoy, Hunts, East Huntsville and Churchill. 
Um, I mean, the initial initial response, and I, I totally understand it, is that, and they're all in very similar locations, um, semi-rural locations outside of the villages, um, which, are, which are a short walk into the villages, um, uh, certainly in Chedsoy and East Huntsville. Um, and over the nine years that we've opened those homes, um, there has been no issue around, uh, understandably, people sort of who aren't sure of how a children's home would operate in the area um, would have concerns. But I, I'm sure those local parish councils have not had the concerns from the last nine years of th those three homes. Um, Headway, as um, unlike a lot of providers, we do um, just provide uh, or have only just provided placements over the last 10 years for local young people, uh, where a lot of providers will sort of take young people from London, the home counties, the West Midlands, etc. Um, we're, we're quite proud of only taking young people from the South West over the last 10 years. We're on all the frameworks of the other places, but we, we purposely do that because it's better for the child and it's better for logistics and communication with social workers, children, and also they can attend meetings in their local authority um, buildings, whether they're Bridgewater, Somerset, Western Super Mayor, um, etc. Um, in regards to the staff movement, I mean, we have looked at this and Somerset County Council have um, visited the site um, around one minute uh, to go. The, the parking situation there. Um, we do have the shift pattern, which we'll be fortunate of um, two days on. So the staff work 48 hours, then have four days off. Um, like I say, a lot of um, old local authority contracts with children's homes or, or any type of homes with 12 hour shifts, eight hour shifts, and there you're sort of times in the handovers by three. So effectively, you're having one handover every week. Um, we, we've sort of put in contingency plans of staff reversing in to the property and that to minimise the amount of um, disruption on the road. Um, no, so, uh, so of apologies to Chapel Allerton for not um communicating with them um we did we did well, well gonna, i'll have to call it i'm sorry I'll to, that's the three minutes but thank you thank sorry, you thanks. thanks members uh any comments or questions i've got councillor hendry first please thank you chairman burwell house okay i actually went out there yesterday at half past two and i sat for 15 minutes or so uh, and there was not one uh, vehicle of any type, nothing came past for about 15 minutes, nothing at all. The car park, I had a really good look at it because I know there's a lot of contention there. And the picture on the screen doesn't do it justice. It's actually bigger than what it, than what it looks on the screen. You can easily get four cars in there easily. And if you really, really, really tried, you could probably squeeze a fifth one in too. The staff change over every 48 hours. It's not as if it's every day, nine till five. It's not, it's every 48 hours. So how can that possibly cause a problem? It's seen on the screen here, raise concern to potential noise nuisance to neighbours. There only is one property and that's across the other side of the road. There's nothing else even close to it, absolutely nothing. Four children or minors, call it what you will. Supposing this house, this family had four children of their own given just say they were over 18, just for talking, and they all had their own vehicle, everybody. How does that work? You couldn't complain then because they're already there, that's the family, that's what they got. Children having a children's home couldn't be more important at all to anybody than children having a safe environment, a warm house and a happy home. This particular place lends itself to just that. It's in a rural environment, very quiet, doesn't interfere with anybody. The traffic is not a problem. I just don't understand why people are saying that. There's another thing on here that says the capacity of the foul drainage at the property should be investigated for suitability. <laughs> really? What, from four additional children? As it, that just comes back to what if they had four children of their own? How does that change anything at all? Nothing. It just stays exactly the same. There's no problem with ecology or anything like this. The highways are on board with it. I, I I just do not for the life of me understand the problem. There, as I said at the beginning, there was no traffic movement for the 15 minutes at 2.30 I was there yesterday. The car park is adequate, although there's a lot of moans and groans, it is actually adequate for it. And children especially, above all, do deserve a happy, safe, warm home. And I am 100% in favour of this as it stands. No problem whatsoever. 
Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Evans. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Chairman. I want to echo a lot of what, what Councillor Hendry's just said there. This sort of facility is hugely needed in Somerset. Um, the, the, the figure that was quoted from Julian Worcester of the numbers of our children that are accommodated outside of our county um, are eye-watering and the cost of that is, 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 is massive as well. So it's absolutely a desperately needed facility. What um, The only thing that, that does concern me about this application is the parking situation. I just want to clarify in my mind um, what is, what's being asked of us. My understanding is that there is a permanent vehicle on site associated with the accommodation and that there will be a changeover of two members of staff at eight o'clock in the morning and there are three car parking spaces to do that changeover and I can't make the maths work there. Um, could someone explain it to me? Um, it's my only it's my only question around this. Otherwise, wholeheartedly in favour. Mr. Titchener. Mr. Um, just simply because I've got the benefit of the parking layout in front of me that was approved on the previous application. Um, that was effectively to create a six-bedroom house and we asked for four, at least four parking spaces. So on what you can see on the screen there, there are three spaces side by side in front of the annex building, which is the one, the one at the back of the plot on the right. So they can all be accessed independently of each other. And then there's one place to the left-hand side of the annex. Now that is the approved scheme and I would just confirm that the parish council did not object to that when a six bedroom family house was created. They did raise it as a concern and we clarified it and they withdrew their objection on the previous application. So yes, when presumably, the, I, I would assume the vehicle at the back would be the vehicle that lives with the, the house for, to take the residents out. When if there are two residents, the two resident staff there, and two arrive to replace. I think there will be, for a short changeover period, because there will obviously be a handover period, there is possibility that one space, one car would have to park, either double park across the front or just on the, you know, in the in the in the entrance. Um, if Dean shows the photograph there, I think there would be room just to pull in and basically double park on everyone. And yes, as with a family house there will be some jockeying around when people move their cars. Looking at the historic Google aerial photographs, there is a car parked on Google Earth, just like I've just said. And I think that's what happened occasionally. And I don't, and that, the highways officer is aware of that, is aware of the park, likely parking arrangements, which we will secure by condition. And yes, there may be a passing time such as a delivery or when the staff change over where someone might park in the bell mouth of the access. But that's not to say the application is unacceptable, but we're not, I think we accept it will probably happen now and again, but there's no reason to assume it will be unsafe. Councillor Evans? Yeah, I'm, I'm really reassured by that answer as to how that will be managed and I can see that working. So I, I do appreciate the, the, the officer's response on that, so thank you. Um, the, the other question I did have is I'm not clear from the paperwork as to what the, need, the care needs of the young people who would be living here are. Do we have any um, information that would that would just inform their likely need in terms of access to the community uh, and access to their educational facilities as well? I, I don't think we've regarded that as material planning consideration. The use is as a care home with resident carers. The nature of the care, I don't think, is something that we should be debating, and we certainly haven't raised it as officers. Thank you. It, I think it, it, it potentially does have, have, have implication on the um, traffic management, which is what I was, I was going to. I do appreciate that the needs aren't a material planning, planning issue. Um, and my third question I have temporarily forgotten so please excuse on post-covid my brain is 
much at even more much than it might be usually <laughs> so, so, so if i may come back when i remember Absolutely. it that will be grand thank you no problem um just just from my own comments i mean i think it's it's notable obviously from the parish council they haven't objected to this in principle it is the parking issues and like councillor Revens, i've been trying to work out how this works um i think it's useful that mr corbyn is here and has heard the discussion is aware of the concerns that that residents have and, and hopefully as operational manager will make sure that staff are if this does go through that staff are aware that they need to manage that handover period because it i think it is the difference between a domestic where you would have four cars going on site and staying there here we know it's got six cars that got to juggle but with only four being on site at any one time so i think there are some logistical issues that will will need to be carefully managed but as others have said, I think uh, I, I'm, a, I'm aware actually of the site in East Huntspool that is managed and, and there was a great deal of concern before it opened. It has been incredibly well managed and it has fitted into the community very, very well. And, and one would hope with the same sort of uh, professionalism, if, if that is carried out here, that will also be the case. Uh, I've got Councillor Evans coming back and then I've got Councillor Facey and then Hendry. Uh, thank you. I did. I, I wrote the question down, so I found it in my notes. So, so my apologies, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was really reassured by Mr. Corbyn um, saying that this this will be a facility used for children from across the the, 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 the local area, rather than um, I know there are many similar facilities in Somerset that take children from a wide area. Are, are we able to secure that by condition in any way? Or is do we do do we have to have, or do we take Mr. Corbyn's word um, at this stage and 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 um, hope that that, um, that that the track record of this company speaks for itself? Mr. Noon, I I'm afraid we can't insist on that any more than we could insist on the uh, existing family home be occupied by someone from Somerset. Okay, so I've now got councillors. <laughs> I've got Councillor Facey, then Councillor Hendry, and then Councillor Scott. So, Councillor Facey, if you've got a mic. The clarity, Chairman, is that actually being proposed? As, that as yet, we have not had a proposal. Well, in that case, Chairman, I would like to be the person to do that, uh, obviously with all the bits and pieces yeah. and braces with it. Thank you. Councillor I'm Evans. happy to second Councillor Facey's proposal and his bits and pieces as well. Thank you. Councillor Hendry. I was going to say, sorry, I was going to second it there, but Bill got to it. Uh, just one last point. We're not talking about HMO here. It's simply a safe haven for four children, not causing any problem. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Scott. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. I just want to echo what's been said, actually. I understand the locals' concerns, but unfortunately, in this day, <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> in this day and age, I don't think we can be controller of all things. Um, and I would be happy that the, the management is is good enough and robust enough to actually organise the situation because it is on a difficult corner. Um, I'd just like to say that it is welcome that these children are given a safe haven. And reading the report, um, I think the children that will be placed there are possibly ones that will want to live in a rural environment, or that's the understanding. So maybe they don't want to be in with the hustle and bustle of a village life, but they are close to facilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing any other comments from members, so I have had a proposal on seconder to, to grant permission with the outline conditions. All those in favour, please show. That would appear to be unanimous. That is unanimous. That's clearly carried. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to suggest, members, that we take a short comfort break, uh, so 10 minutes, and then we'll be restarting again at 11 o'clock. Thank you. Right, members, it's uh, 11 o'clock, so if we can come back to, uh, back to the meeting. And if you can turn in your papers, please, to page 24. And uh, we're in uh, Wemden... Wembley Road, Bridgewater. And uh, Ms. Elvey, I think you're presenting this one, please. Hello. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so this is the application at the Quantock in, on Wemden Road in Bridgewater. The application is before members as the officer's recommendation is contrary to the view of a ward member. The ward member is objecting to the application due to concerns relating to impacts on the residential amenities of neighbouring occupants. 
So this slide lists the policies from the local plan that are relevant to the application. The main considerations for this application are the principle of the development and impacts on visual and residential amenity and the historic environment. The application site is within the boundary of Bridgewater and lies to the west of Bridgewater Town Centre. The pub is north of the A39, otherwise known as Quantock Road, and is accessed by Wemden Road that borders the site to the northeast. The site accommodates the Quantock, a pub restaurant business that has operated from the Grade 2 listed building since the early 20th century. The application seeks consent for the erection of a detached timber bar within the existing established seating area that serves the pub. The structure will be sited along the northern boundary of the site and will have a footprint of approximately 4.3 metres by 2.5. The structure will have a flat roof with a height of approximately 2.7 metres. Uh, here's some views of the site from public vantage points. As you can see, due to the existing um, fencing and trees, it's hard to actually see into the site from the public highway. And these are more photos of the site as you approach the pub garden area. So this is the established seating area, which also includes a pergola and um, booths, which you can sort of see um, on the left-hand pictures. And these were granted consent last year, along with the festoon lighting. The red arrow indicates where the proposed structure will be. Um, views of the site from the public highway, as previously said, are limited due to the fencing and trees that you can sort of see the other side of in these photos. So the application site lies within the development boundary for Bridgewater and relates to an existing established business. The proposal is considered to be required to support the existing business and the external seating area that has recently been refurbished. The applicant has stated that they require the structure to reduce queuing inside the building. Originally, the structure was proposed to be sited immediately adjacent to the Grade 2 listed building. However, this has been relocated to be along the northern boundary of the site to ensure that there is a clear visual separation from the protected heritage asset and the proposed structure. Additionally, the uh, timber building will be painted dark grey as per this sample you can see on the slide, and this will match the colour of the pergola. And if consent is granted, this will only be for five years. A temporary consent is considered to allow for the business to be supported and adequately resourced, but would enable the council to review the situation in five years' time. It will also protect the setting of the Grade 2 listed building should the structure deteriorate over time. In respect of impact on residential amenity, the site is surrounded by residential properties. However, the building has been used as a drinking establishment for several decades. The part of the site where the structure is to be built is currently used for seating, and it is not considered that the development would introduce any undue or new activity to the site. The distances from the neighbouring properties are also shown on this slide in metres. Environmental health have been consulted and they've recommended conditions in respect of operating hours of the bar and for if any external lighting is to be later installed. And this is in line with the conditions in place for the pergola and seating area that were previously granted consent. It is considered, therefore, that the proposal complies with the rele relevant policies of the local plan and temporary consent is therefore recommended to be approved with conditions to ensure that the structure is painted appropriately and that the environmental health recommendations are um, conditioned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, members, as you see, we have a speaker on this one. Uh, Mark Cooper, if you'd like to come forward, please. Good, good morning. And just remind you, you've got three minutes. You will see it on the on the clock. So start whenever you're ready, please. OK, good morning, everyone. Yeah, you can hear me. Um, so I live at number 74 Wemden Road, which you cannot see the property. It's just to the north. Yes, there. So my I moved into the property three years ago um, before the previous um, planning application was granted. And we were unable to hear any activity in the pub. It was quite a peaceful family, family pub. Since the previous application and now this one, um, we are suffering with extensive and excessive noise disturbance that you can hear in my property because of the front garden is all to the front aspect of my property. And the noise can even be heard in my property. It goes on in, in the winter, obviously it's quieter because there's not the clientele that are drinking outside. But in the summer, it's 10, 12 hours a day until closing time, which is meant to be 11 o'clock, but 
I have known this go on and the previous planning suggested lighting had to be off at 11 but this isn't being adhered to and I have got uh, evidence of that. In the previous planning there was no mention of the stripping of the vegetation that is done on the trees that are not shown on that plan. So now the noise levels, there's no natural um, natural vegetation to stop that noise and it's it's excessive and it's unbearable. Um, at times in the summer we're unable to use our front garden um, and we seek neighbours and friends to enjoy the um, summer due to the excessive levels of noise. As well as that, like I said, it used to be a quiet family pub. Um, it's attracting now a different clientele, groups of youths and adults who drink to all hours. And in the last lockdown, the police have been called several times to disperse these large groups that are congregating in the garden because it's changed from that quiet family pub into a uh, hangout for some undesirable locals. Um, and it's causing those excessive noise disturbances that we have to have to bear. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Before I come to members, Ms. Albert, do you want to comment on any of the issues there and also the, the relationship between this application and licensing and what's going on on the site as well? I think it might be useful just to clarify. Sure, yeah. So um, the conditions that have been suggested are more restrictive, I suppose, than the operating hours of the pub. If there are, if a statutory nuisance occurs, and this is a, an issue for environmental health to deal with, so a complaint would have to be made with environmental health. In terms of there being breaches of the previous conditions on the previous consent, that would be a matter for planning enforcement. So a complaint would have to be made to enforcement and that would be investigated accordingly. Um, I think that's all I would say. Okay. Mr. Noon? Um, just also, I just would sort of underline that the, the restrictions that we have imposed through the Grants for Planning Commission can only reasonably relate to the development that those planning applications approved. So whilst the seating area has got some hours, uh, some lighting conditions on it, uh, hours of lighting and whatnot, elsewhere in the pub beer garden, those conditions wouldn't bite because they weren't imposed on the use of the land as a beer garden. That's already there. So where we've supported the introduction of the outdoor seating in structures that need planning permission, those are subject to conditions, and certainly this is what this bar would, would be covered by. What we do need to bear in mind is that the wider use of the garden as a, in conjunction with the pub, that's a lawful use that, that, that exists by virtue of right. I think it's, you said, Millie, it's, it's over about 100 years it's been going on for. So we do have to accept that we have some limitations. We accept that the application has been approved for the additional sitting area and this bar facilitate that beer garden use. But we have to acknowledge that it exists anyway. And we really, you know, through the, these grants of permission, we look to control the little bits that we have, you know, the, the gift of planning permission over. So we need to sort of, just, to just need, there's a slight tension there. It may be that there's a light on somewhere else in the beer garden that wouldn't be covered, but we would certainly, you yeah, know, any, any reports that the seating area is not being used in accordance with permission, we can investigate as we would, if this is approved, the bar area, which we're saying should be tied to those hours. Okay. Councillor Kingham, you indicated. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm a, I saw a problem with this because I, I agree with the officer. Yeah, the, the public house has been there for a long time. So has the garden, but the people using the garden now haven't been there for a long time. Obviously, circumstances that have happened over the last two years have created a lot more outdoor entertaining, etc. But there again, these people living lo locally around the premises have suddenly got to put up with a lot more than they expected to. So I find it very difficult to approve something like this when you're creating more people outside making noise. And I know this, this there is obviously a licensing application affected to this as well. But at the moment, I'm afraid I can't support this because I think it's unfair to create more 
noise and disturbance to the local residents who have been there probably as long as the, the garden. Ms. Elvey? Thank you. Yeah, all I would say to that is, as you highlight, it is an existing drinking establishment. This seating area, even before the more formalised seating that was granted consent, has been used as an external seating area for the pub. Um, currently, where the um, bar is going to go, there's like a picnic table at the moment. So, you know, is one going to cause more noise than the other? People are all going to go to the pub anyway. Um, and this is another reason as well why we're doing a five-year consent, you know, hopefully to review the situation in five years. You know, they, they want this to reduce queuing inside the building because of COVID. And I appreciate that, you know, that's not, you know, you just don't know, do you, when things are going to change, but at least that gives us an opportunity to review things. Yeah, I do appreciate, yeah, it's five years, but if you're if you're living close to that, five years is a long time to put up with uh, a lot of disturbance while you're trying to have a bit of downtime of your own in the garden. I think the only thing I would say, Councillor Kingham, is obviously the application that's in front of us at the moment is purely for the outside bar. It's not for the use of the space that's currently under yeah, use. Appreciate that, Chairman. Okay. I've got Councillors Hendry, Scott, and Ribbons. So, Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A case like this, the pub was built before the house. So, if you're going to buy the house, you know the pub's there before you actually move into it. Very unfortunate circumstances uh, for the for the speaker who's here because if he has any complaints, as a case officer pointed out, you're bringing them to the wrong place. They should be either licensing uh, or the planning control. So unfortunately for the for the, the speaker, he's actually bringing the complaints to the wrong place in the first place, and the pub was there first. In the good weather, if you have people there drinking or whatever the case is, having a cigarette, they're going to stand outside the pub in the garden anyway. That's what people do. So as much as it's very unfortunate, the circumstances, we have to deal with what's on the table before us on the here and now, what might be or what has been, it's just actually what's on the table. So reluctantly, for the reasons I've just pointed out, I would actually have to say it's acceptable and it's a little bit unfortunate for the, for the people living next door. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Oh, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, under... Um, Item five, it says there should be no amplified or live music played within the external bar herewith approved. Um, could you just confirm if they have got permission to play loud music in the car park or in the garden area anyway? Um, because that appears to be the part of the problem that there is loud music coming from there. Um, and the other thing is, I was wondering, going back on the screening issue, is there anything we could do to actually insist that there's some sort of sound um, screening. I think you can get a screen that hmm. minimises the sound. Thank you. Ms. Elvey. Uh, thank you. Um, in terms of the amplified or live music, so the consent for the seating area from last year that had a matching um, condition restricting it. Um, in terms of the licence for the pub, they do have um, a license for activity similar to live music, recorded music, Monday to Sunday, 10 in the morning till midnight. So it's at least the, the, the things that have been granted consent have been restricted in terms of whether or not that takes place in that place. It's, um, sorry, what was what was the other question about some screening? Sorry. Um, I mean, Adrian. If, yeah, if I could have just help on that point, um, obviously the bar itself with that condition to say you won't use it as somewhere to put your speakers um, shouldn't in its own right be a source of noise. People just be ordering drinks there. So it's a question of where would a screen serve any purpose? Where would you insist that it goes? Um, it, yeah, you'd probably need, you know, you've got to, uh, the photographs show quite a high fence along that northern edge so you've got something there already that will serve to a degree but it's probably because the beer garden is a historic use it wasn't a con it's not a planning condition for that uh, i don't see that it would be reasonable on this application alone to insist that they upgrade that northern fence to an acoustic barrier if we were dealing with a planning application for the use of the land as a beer garden, yes, we probably would, but it's already got that use. So I think it would be unreasonable here. What I suppose in members' minds you need to judge is, would the provision of this bar 
facilitate an intensification of the use of the beer garden such that, su that such sound mitigation measures are justified. Now, you could decide that. We don't think that would be a reasonable because of, yeah, we've already got quite a lot of seating out here. People can order their drinks by app these days. I doubt this bar, given its footprint, if Millie could just show that, I doubt it will be stopped with every single drink available at the pub. Um, so it does seem to me that it, it's, it's something, it's a stopgap, which is why we're going for this, temp this temporary permission. If you feel five years is too long, you could curtail it to three. Um, they could apply to extend it, depending on how it goes. But we just feel that this external bar is something that is needed in current circumstances. I, I, I'd be surprised if it was a permanent feature, simply because of the difficulties in running it. You know, it would be difficult to run taps for draft beer all the way out to here. It's, it's something they're trying to do to keep the business going, is my feeling, which is why a temporary permission, I think, is, is, is appropriate. Thank you. I've got Councillor Revens and Councillor Murphy and then Councillor Bolt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think Councillor, uh, sorry, Mr. Noon has just just possibly answered my questions, which were that can we reduce the the temporary nature of this in five years? On, I hope we still don't have COVID lurking around, and in five years' time, in the same way. And but certainly, we do note that the, that the government has seen wise to reduce social distancing measures or, or, or eliminate them anyway. Um, I do agree with with uh, Councillor Scott about the need. Um, to look at reducing the impact of the noise on neighbouring properties. Um, reference was made to some planting being renewed, re removed, which would have um, had some impact, I'm, I'm sure. Um, clearly, to me, having an outside bar would increase the garden usage, and so I think that was a reasonable condition to add. Um, reference has also been made to um, development control complaints um, that the existing operation is outside of what their existing permissions. Do we have an update on where that development control is? Because it always feels slightly pointless if we propose lots of conditions that are just going to be ignored. Thank you. Are we aware of, of a report to enforcement that they're following up? I'm, I'm not aware of one. I, I, you know, it, it can be investigated um, if there is if there is a breach. Um, I just need to sort of flag up that point that anything within the beer garden per se is not automatically covered by the conditions on the seating area or you know, the bar area if this were to be approved. So we just I just make that point that the, the beer garden is, is basically governed by the licence as a whole. Okay, so am, am I able to propose that as an propose the two amendments that I've yeah. outlined to reduce the temporary nature to? I think the suggestion was three years. I've written down two, so I'm <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm happy to be guided with, by 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 colleagues and to um, agree a um, acoustic fence. Mr. Noon. I mean, obviously, the, the, the grant of permission is being considered in the round by the committee today. And yes, you could reduce the time scale. If the applicant feels it's too short, they can appeal it. But that's that's fair enough. I would have thought three is more reasonable than two. Um, but that's really you know, for members to consider. Um, in terms of acoust additional acoustic measures, um, there is there's already two fences here. So the area, if you can, with those three trees on the northern boundary, there's a fence both sides of that. Is that it? Uh, yeah, if you could, if, if you, you I'll show you on the photos. So, if you see on the photo at the bottom, there's those um, green kind of sticky up poles on the bottom photo. It looks like a trampoline net. It, I don't think it is a trampoline, but if you look at that point of reference, there's a fence this side of it which looks a bit, you know, older. Mm. Whereas when you look at in, from inside the pub beer garden on the top right photo, do you see those um, green posts again that look like the trampoline net? The fencing this side of that. Um, is newer, so it seems to have already have two lines of fencing. I guess that's historic. Um, but in addition to that, there is there are those trees there as well. Um, yeah. I... So, so I think if we go back to the layout plan, it's 
kind of we need to be quite clear if, if we are minded to put a condition on to say we want additional acoustic screening we need to be saying where that should be and why it is necessary as a result of this bar because you know the bar is just the application is just simply that little red oblong in the top right hand corner of the beer garden so to say that that necessitates a, an acoustic screen on the south side of the beer garden might be a bit of a tall order. But if members are concerned that people queuing at the bar are going to be the source of the noise, then you know, some, some along that northern boundary, you may take the view that that is justified. But it is just the bar area that we are looking at in this permission. Could, could I also ask one further question in terms of reasonableness of conditions in terms of length? I guess the more costs we put on them in terms of landscaping or fencing, the longer you would expect the term to be because they've got to have the reasonable ability to deal with that. So maybe a two year would be reasonable if there wasn't extra costs, whereas <clears throat> a longer period would be reasonable if there was more costs. I think I think that's probably a very, okay. very reasonable point to make if, you know, because if you're a shorter period, we would get uh, without acoustic measures, we would get the review earlier. Yeah. Councillor Evans, do you want to say anything more or move on to Councillor Murphy? Fair enough. Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm slightly confused about this. Um, I, I heard um, the, the reason for the bar was given as to help with the people going into the pub <clears throat> and to reschedule them back out to the bar. In other words, it was spacing. It's about spacing due to COVID. If we are to believe that COVID is now in retreat and over, it still is there, of course, but it's not the same as it was before, and it's no longer acute. Um, so therefore, the reason for having the bar is removed, as far as I can see. We don't need to schedule that into the garden, and I would probably object to that on those grounds. But secondly, um, the most noise usually is at the bar. I mean, I, I, having visited many bars in my time, um, there's a great deal of discussions at the bar. People like to, if in a way, pose at the bar, stand at the bar, drink at the bar, commune at the bar. And this is the problem you have. And, and listening to the, 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 the speaker who spoke passionately about his condition, which I appreciate is not relevant from the point of view it's the wrong place to bring the complaint i accept that that is quite clear although it's it's rather in a way dismissive to say that when they've come because i think they obviously we have to take a care for that person and i think their evidence is is really valid um and i think the problem is that by if you grant this bar you are amplifying the noise almost automatically for reasons that you've already said are not valid because you there is no longer the need to stop people going into the bar to order their drinks. If you allow this to go through, you will be automatically amplifying the bar if we consider that people like to stand at bars and bars are to some extent noisy because of glasses, because of various things. So my, my, I would vote, uh, I certainly could not vote for this on those grounds. Even if you were considering a, an acoustic fence, which I think might be something marginal because you know the fact that the noise is accumulating in this place is affecting these people so my personal feeling is that we should vote against this thank Mr. you chairman i think i would just say i mean i don't think anyone is attempting to minimize or, or dismiss the the concerns that the the speaker has, has raised the difficulty we have is those concerns are an existing problem before this has ever happened so this application isn't going to address those. I, I would strongly suggest that, that the speaker, whatever the outcome today is, needs to be talking potentially to their ward councillor because from my own view here, I think there's an environmental health issue, there's a licensing issue, and there is a planning enforcement issue. So there are three different strands of the council that need to be talked to, and it might be best doing that through a ward member rather than trying to find that way yourself. But I would certainly suggest that is, is in terms of dealing with the existing problem, that has to be dealt with elsewhere. All we can deal with at the moment is the impact of this particular small building that is being added on and whether that has a su substantial effect. 
Ms. Alvey, was there anything you wanted to say or, or Mr. Noon before I come can, to the Can I just say, in speakers? terms of whether or not it's needed, I appreciate that, yes, central government, there are no COVID restrictions, but that doesn't mean that people, customers, aren't still nervous. Um, you know, and if this is the, the peace of mind that the business wants to provide their customers in order to encourage them back into the pub, you know, that's perhaps their business model or whatever. You know, they haven't given any more information than that, but I just think it's a point worth saying. In, in terms of the, the noise generated, you know, environmental health were consulted on this application and they haven't objected. They've provided conditions in order to make it, you know, in order to mitigate for the structure. If a statutory nuisance does occur in terms of the levels of noise that are generated, then that needs to be raised with environmental health and they would then investigate with their, you know, the processes that they follow. And Adrian, I don't know okay, I've got Mr Noon and I'm coming to Councillor Bolt. Right. Yeah, and I, I would just say that we are trying through the Grants and Planning Commission to quieten down the beer garden. The licence is till midnight, but all the permissions we've been we've granted in the beer garden have controlled it till 11. So we're trying to get it quietened down. So the outside seating area needs to be quietened down. Um, yeah, and lights, so lights off at, at 11 fully aware that the pub is allowed to stay open till midnight. We're suggesting here that the external bar finishes at 11 as well. So we can't take away their right to have the beer garden and operate it in accordance with their licence. But we are trying to sort of just suppress the activities after 11 through the grants of these permissions for the extra bits they want. Whether that is enough for members to okay. accept this application is, is, is why we're here debating it today. Okay, I've got councillors Bolt, then Hendry, and then Grimes. Councillor Bolt. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, with regards to the application, it's, it's, I can understand the COVID issue, but as we quite often get told on this committee, that's not a planning condition anymore because the government have said that this is over, we have restrictions, we, some of us wear masks, etc. I think if we allow five years, that will become this to, this to become a, a permanent structure. Um, I think we should be looking at restricting it till the time that the COVID issue is over. So if that means a review annually or, or uh, every two years, great. Next thing is, I did, we, there's nothing here about um, noise caused by the bar being monitored because obviously it's going to have fridges and coolers in it. Now that's a, a, an annoying background noise which I've, I've had to live with myself and there doesn't seem to be any um, restrictions on monitoring that at say a neighbour's boundary. Uh, Mr Noon? Yeah, I I think with the reason my environmental health officers have not gone there is because it would probably the noise emanating from this beer garden is already lawful and you know it's 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 an existing thing to be able to distinguish one component of that noise at the nearest noise sensitive dwelling I think would be impossible that's what how would you know if it's the little bar that's causing the noise as opposed to the beer garden as a whole. That's why I think they haven't suggested that condition. When the pub, shut, when the pub is shut, the, 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 they're not going to be switching off the fridges and coolers overnight, are they? Uh, I, I doubt it, no. The, the, that's, that infrastructure is presumably already attached to the pub. And it's, I don't believe on this thing there's any external plant being up, we're being asked to consider. It's all within this little shed. I'm, I'm seeing a, pla a fan planned on it, which I can only assume is for cooling. And you, they're not going to be bringing out cold uh, equipment every day. There's going to be fridges, etc., running out there. They might bring a python out there for some of the beers, but there's still going to be fridges running there. We looking at the plan. We could certainly, if, if members are concerned by that particular issue, we could ask for conditions of any of the equipment to be installed, to be submitted to and agreed in consult, consultation with environmental health officers to make sure that it is appropriate for this building. Um, I, as I say, yes, yeah, there, there would be some operational noise from it. Um, we, we can, can yeah, we do routinely condition that sort of thing on other types of application that might well bring coolers and whatnot. But there's no no reason. I think environmental health officers are comfortable that it, there's no reason to assume that that sort of thing would be a problem. But 
on a safe precautionary basis, yes, condition. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I've then got Councillor Hendry and then Councillor Grimes. Councillor Hendry. Thank you. Before I say anything else, Millie, do you know roughly how many tables is in the beer garden? Just roughly. You don't have to count them. Just give me like 10, 15, something like that. Sorry. A lot. There's yeah. um, the pergola. They have sort of um, seating areas which probably sit about eight in each section. You've then got the, the sheds, um, which probably again, eight in each section. And then the well, whole garden. It's all, as you can see, yeah. it's quite... Well, shall we just agree and say perhaps 20? Just Shall we just agree on that? I think that's very, yeah, at least 20. Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, 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 okay, shall we go for 30? Okay. Sure, yeah. <laughs> just let's say for average, there's four people sitting at each table for the evening, okay? So that's us on 120 people straight away. That's already there. Mm. That's, in, that's in place now. So you have a good summer's night, 120 people in the garden, all the seats are full. They want a drink, they have to go into the bar to get it. If, they, if there's a, a bar in the garden, you don't have any more people. The people are already there. So all they're doing really in effect is walking across the garden to get their drink, their pint of beer and go and sit down again. So why would anybody say there's going to be a lot of noise at the bar when the people have already got their seats, they're going to buy their drink, their pint of beer, their orange juice and go and sit down again. You're not generating any more traffic. The people are already there. And all they're doing is just walking over, get their drink and sit down again. The the talk of coming back from five years to four years or three years is irrelevant, completely irrelevant. If they have the, the license to go for three years, once the three years has passed, they're going to ask to extend it anyway. And then they've already had three years use. So it'd be very difficult, very difficult to say, no, you can't have it because it's already been running for three or four years. So if they're applying for five years, you might as well just draw a line and say, OK, have it. Because what's the difference? You either refuse it completely, everything, Absolutely, or stick with the five years because to say three or four is just it just doesn't work. And as I said already, you've already got your 120 people in the garden to save them going into the place to buy a drink. And I know COVID is, I know I get all that too. Some people are still a bit afraid of it. Some are not. Some are okay, but it saves the people actually saying right, I have to go into the bar to get a drink. Shall I put a face mask on or not, or just walk across the garden, get a pint, and go and sit down. So. As it stands, because I've said about five times, we're only dealing with what's on the table in front of us. It's not such a bad thing at all. On that basis, I'd like to bring forward your recommendation and say to grant permission. Thank you. OK, I would just say one, only one comment in terms of the, the, the limiting the time. The advantage of the limiting the time, as we've done for five years or whatever the, the shorter term would be, is that at that point they would have to reapply if there have been issues that have been caused by that bar, then we've got evidence that there's an issue. Whereas at the moment, we don't have that evidence to say this particular part of the bar is going to cause a problem. So that, that's the only reason for looking at the time scale. But um, I've got Councillor Grimes. Can you hear me? Yes. That's fine. Could we go back to the plan, please? That's the one. Can you just point out where the bar is and where the gentleman's house is? Um, who was the speaker? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So the bar is going to be this red square at the top. Um, you see there's number 72 there. The speaker lives at number 74, which is a property. Um, I'll show you on the aerial. I think it's that one. It's It's got quite a large front garden, so it's further set back than those properties you can see on the map. So it's quite a long way away then, really. Um, I've got measurements here for some of the neighbouring properties. I don't have it for number 74 exactly, but that perhaps gives a, an idea of scale. Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you for that. Um, with that in mind, I'm happy to second the recommendation um, with conditions. Thank you. OK, just... The to clear out in my mind that there are the conditions that within the report at the moment i the proposal that was made was as stands in the report as i understand it which was the the five-year term and no other conditions additional over and above what is in the report that, yes that is my understanding the only conditions have been some changes that i've got noted in debate was whether to make it shorter or whether to add a condition about the any plant or equipment in there and I don't believe the proposer included either of those. Council Revens, you indicated. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I amend the proposal, please? You can certainly propose. And my amendment. amendment would be to reduce the temporary nature to three years and have a condition on an acoustic fence to be agreed with officers and controls over the equipment noise, as uh, I thought it was Councillor Bolt um, suggested as well. Okay. Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I would be happier if we could reduce the time um, down to three years. Um, and if Councillor Hendry would be happy with that, I would stick to second in that proposal. So, Councillor Hendry, just to confirm with the two proposals and seconds, are you happy with the conditions that have been suggested by Councillor Evans? That's not unreasonable, and yes, I'm happy to go along with that. Thank you. And you're happy with that? Yes. Yeah. So that's the three years uh, to, to have a some form of acoustic fencing and also a condition relating to the equipment to be agreed that's going in relating to fans, fridges and whatever. Yeah. Okay. Everybody clear on what's been proposed? And, no, hold on. If, if, if I noon. could, just so that we're all clear on the acoustic fencing, um, really, are you able to just put up the plan again? I, you know, very clearly expressed by Councillor Murphy that the noise of people ordering at the bar was an area of, well, certainly concern for him. I would suggest with that in mind, we sort of, you know, just for the sake of clarity, so everyone knows the extent we're looking at here, is we look along the northern and eastern boundary fences in the immediate vicinity of the bar, so maybe four or five metres to the west and down a long, similar distance along. Which boundary? Yeah. So it, the, what the lines we're seeing, um, I mean, it just, is, the, is this fence still there? But it's a new, there is a fence there. So there is a fence already there. That might need a little bit of beefing up. But what I'm suggesting is we go along the northern boundary and down the eastern boundary to provide some acoustic screening in the immediate vicinity of the bar. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So okay. with, with the details to be submitted to and agreed in writing prior to first okay. operation of. Okay, Councillors Hendry and Grimes, you're happy with that. Councillor Scott, you indicated. Yeah, it does say in the report that I think it's one. Oh, there is a house that's twenty metres away. Would that sort of help that house? I think the nearest house there, uh, yes, we can look at some screening to return. You know, we, we will bear that house in mind as well with the, this. We could get a little bit of screening sort of along the side of the, the bar. Um, but I think we've got to be looking at the immediate vicinity of yes. the bar rather than the whole of the beer garden. OK. Everybody clear as to what the proposal is? That, that So we're looking at granting permission, three years, Acoustic fencing in the in effect the top right hand corner around the bar, and a condition to be agreed with environmental health about what goes into the bar in terms of noise creating um, machinery. Okay, so that recommendation has been moved and seconded. All those in favour, please show. Can you take the screen box off the yeah. I don't think it was it unanimous. <laughs> yes, I think. Okay, I thought Councillor, I, I missed Councillor Kingham first time round. So no, that is unanimous. Okay, clearly carried. And and again, as I said earlier, I would suggest you do have a word with ward councillors in terms of the other departments within the council that can help address the existing issues that may be occurring. Right, members. Uh, if we move to our next application on page thirty-one. Uh, we move to Chapel Allison and we have Mr. Kitchener uh, back to present for us. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Yeah, it's on your screen. Yeah, right, excellent. 
Uh, okay, so the application is for the conversion of an existing detached garage to form a uh, two-storey ancillary accommodation and the erection of an extension uh, to the rear, so on its uh, south side, and the installation of a uh, cabrio velux. I'll show in the photos um, what that is. So a property, a residential property known as the Old Dairy uh, Stone Allerton Drove in Stone Allerton. This is property at the very edge of the village with the red line drawn around its uh, boundary. So the property is there, the garage area is there, uh, and this is the land uh, associated with that property. Um, then just to look at the plans that have been submitted. So uh, on here, you'll see where the extension is to be added on the southern side of the uh, existing uh, uh, garaging uh, building. Uh, so it's going to maintain its sort of form. It's a, uh, you'll see from the pictures, it's a very simple traditional to, uh, garage building at the moment, and they're just going to extend out, to maintain the roof line on, on its uh, southern side. Um, and the proposal will therefore, uh, the rooms inside that will be provided will be a workshop and gym at ground floor, and uh, they will provide themselves some uh, officing space at first floor. Uh, so these are the uh, floor plans and elevations. So on the left floor plan showing how they intend to um, subdivide the internal space. So they're going to provide themselves their own gym uh, workshop area, a ground floor, uh, and then they'll just have the office in uh, the space above and there'll be a void in other part of the space. The, the Cabrio Velux is this type of um, type of product off offered by um, Velux company just enables uh, their slightly larger roof lights and you can push these out to form a sort of almost small little balcony sort of area. Um, it's just a product they offer. This is essentially the garage, um, the original part, and then it's being extended. So you can see the form uh, of the building is being maintained. Um, they are proposing to uh, use matching materials and matching stone uh, with some timber cladding. Um, the roof would continue to be in double Roman tiles. So this photograph of the existing, existing double garage, fairly standard design. Uh, so the extension will come out here on this left-hand side of the photograph uh, where this vehicle is currently positioned. So visually, we consider the proposal to be proportionate in scale and design uh, and appropriate to the existing uh, building. And, on that, and in that respect, it would comply with our design policies. It doesn't give rise to any amenity concerns. There are no properties beyond. Um, the, there are only the, um, any windows would only look back towards the existing host dwelling, which is located in the foreground here. So we would consider that there's any amenity issues that would preclude the grant of permission. Uh, this is just looking into the point of access. So you can see the existing house uh, parking area, and then you can see the uh, garage uh, here. So the parish council had raised concerns. Uh, um, one of the points they had mentioned was about the impact on parking and turning areas. Um, even with the proposal built out, that would remain space for the parking of three vehicles and turning space within the site. Um, uh, nonetheless, this house, um, as you will have seen from the um, aerial plans, is the last house in the road. It's on a no-through road. It's on a drove that leads down to a few fields. Uh, there are no other properties beyond. So uh, in the unlikely circumstance that any vehicle would need to reverse out of this access point, it's highly unlikely it's going to give rise to any significant highway safety concerns. Uh, so we don't consider that the... Um, uh, well, we consider there's sufficient parking turning space anyway, and wouldn't consider that there is a highway reason for rejecting this application. Uh, and then just to do with one other issue that the Paris Council had raised, uh, they raised an issue with the red line of the application. So that's the, the red line on the location plan that sort of denotes uh, the land uh, subject uh, to the application. They have stated that a tighter red line should be drawn, uh, one that doesn't go around the, the, the whole plot. Um, they say that doesn't match the red line used from applications in 2004, 2005, when the property was granted uh, permission. Uh, so just some photographs just to get a, uh, a sense of, because the properties have a very large garden. Uh, it's a large, uh, it's quite a large plot. Um, um, this is one of the plans from the 2004 application. So. Um, this is sort of the plot here, and this is the red line that was drawn at that point around um, the house and garage. Um, uh, now, 
Um, that plan doesn't ever seem to have really matched what was on the ground. Uh, the property, the boundaries between it and the dwelling from which it was hived off from at the time um, don't reflect anything that was on uh, on the uh, any boundaries on the ground. Even if you go back to um, um, photos that are sort of 10 plus years old, um, had that red line ever really been implemented, the property would have had no garden whatsoever. Um, this plan does show, um, uh, this is from a 2010 application, and this is the plot here uh, outlined in red. Um, the red line boundary for our current application we're looking at now exactly matches the red line boundary from this one 12 years ago. Um, the parish did not raise any objection to that red line boundary at the time. Um, uh, it doesn't appear that there's been uh, any increase in the garden size, you know, unlawful, unauthorised increase in the garden size. It doesn't appear that there's uh, been any uh, unlawful garden grabbing. If you go back, uh, as we have done through aerial photographs over the last 10 years or more, uh, there's no changes in boundary treatments. It always seems to have been a property with a very large, generous garden. Um, uh, so nonetheless, that's not particularly material to the current application we're looking at, which is to extend and convert a garage. Uh, so what we're looking at is, is it acceptable for them to do that in the form that they've proposed? And we consider that it is, and therefore we wouldn't consider this red line issue to be a matter against which permission should be withheld. So just to summarise, uh, we consider the building to be of acceptable design that retains sufficient on-site parking, uh, and therefore we are recommending permission is granted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, you'll see we have a speaker on this application, uh, Giles Floyd, who I think is joining us through Teams. Hello. Ah, terrific. Yep, yeah, we can hear you. So again, you've got the three minutes. Please start when you're ready. Thank you. Um, so we've carried out our due diligence carefully before we put any plans forward. If we knew in advance that we would not likely receive permission, we, we certainly would not have um, paid the large sums of money that we have for, for plans and applications. We've consulted a local architect um, who actually designed our, our property. We checked if the proposed development would be likely allowed under permissible development, and we've consulted with our neighbours on our plans um, all before um, paying the money for plans and applications. We've even changed the design of the proposed Juliet balcony feature, replacing it with a with a Velux um, construction, which was which was just described. Um, e even though there are recent precedents in the village, a, a recent garage development near the old school rooms, which includes an annex, um, actually has a, a Juliet balcony um, in that building, um, but we've changed ours. Um, currently, I'm working in a, in a seven by seven foot room under the stairs with no windows or, or natural light five days a week. That's my working environment. My wife works from home two days a week on a desk in our bedroom, which is, is, is not ideal. Um, and there are currently four garage builds taking place in the village um, or recently completed, which all include some kind of annex upstairs. In addition to this, garages on our on our own street, three doors up, have been recently been converted into into living space. Our plan is for a gym for our family, um, uh, our son who's seventeen, an office for myself, and, and a, a sort of workshop storage space. And uh, and we we require no additional parking. Um, it, it's just it's just uh, it's just for us. So um, we're not affecting the outlook of the neighbours or the appearance of the village. We're just trying to do something that will make our family and, and work life a little easier and a little less stressful. Um, we're just trying to enhance our quality of life by giving us some, some extra space. As I said, the development appears to comply with permissible development regulations. Our neighbours have no issues and have been fully engaged and are supportive. You have one minute left to go. Sorry to interrupt, Sedgemore, one minute to go. Thank you. Sedgemore planning appear to have no issues with our proposed plan. Uh, but 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 for some reason the parish council um, are saying that they don't want this to to happen and and we just don't know why uh, or understand when when we've been so considerate with our with our due diligence and spent spent the money we have um, so you know I, I you know hopefully um, that uh, this can be looked upon favourably um, and um, and I hope that um, you take this into consideration when deciding on this uh, this application. So thank you ever so much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much. Councillor Kingham, you indicated. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, 
I'm not sure where we need to have much of a debate on this. I don't see a problem with what they've proposed. Um, the reasons why the parish council are against it, I'm not sure why, but um, I would like to recommend the uh, officer's recommendation. Thank you very much. Councillor Revens. Seconded. Is there anyone else who wants to say anything at this point? I don't think there is by the look of it. So, members, you've had it recommended recommended um, that permission should be granted. Uh, all those in favour, please show. That again is unanimous, so clearly carried, so permission granted. Right, members, that then brings us to the next application, uh, which is on page 37, please. Uh, we move to North Petherton. And I think uh, Ian Lloyd is presenting this, and I think you're doing it online. I am, thank you, Chairman. Excellent. Please carry on. Can you hear me okay? We can, certainly can. And can everyone see the slideshow? Uh, we've got it, but it's not presenting yet. It, it's it's on the screen, but you haven't set the the slideshow part going. Ah, apologies. How's that? Uh, no change on nope. mine at the moment, but... Bear with me a second. Oh, we've lost you. Yep, I'm just trying to reset. Okay. Okay, we've got it back, but still no slideshow presentation yet. Okay, apologies. Yeah, if you could, that would be good. Is it not just pressing the... Adrian, is it not just pressing the... No, I'm just going to... Ian, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Have, have you got two screens at home? Or just I have. One. I've got two. So is the presentation, when you press F5 to launch the presentation, yep. it, it, what happens then? You... So I'm, 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 I'm seeing that on my large screen, um, which is what I thought I was, I was presenting. Let, let, let me try and stop. Let's open this again. Kathy. Yeah. Okay. That, that would that would make a lot of sense. We'll we'll take a five minute break while we um we just get the IT bit sorted out. Thank you. Apologies. Thank you, Chair. Right, members. If we can make a make a start again, I think we've got the um the IT up and running. So, Mr. Lloyd, are you with us? Is anybody there? <laughs> and it was and it was all. I, I am I am ch I am chairman. <laughs> okay. You, thank are you. you. Are you hearing me? Excellent. We can now. So um, please go ahead with the North Pedleton one, please. Yeah, I do. I, I do. I do apologise for that technical glitch. So thanks for bearing with me. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so this is an application in the grounds of um, what was uh, formerly Bats Coach House uh, off Newton Road at North Petherton. It's an outline application with all matters reserved, um, seeking planning permission for uh, seven dwellings. So although I've got no updates to report, can members just bear in mind that the the, uh, the, the lighting condition, condition 14, that the reason for that is it's not just an ecology reason. So it's it's also in the interests of, of, of uh, the setting of the heritage assets nearby and local character as well. So we just amend that, that reason if members were mindful to approve today. So turning to the main considerations, um, We've got the principle of development, uh, issues of the sustainability of the location, and the principal issue here is that the site is part of an allocated residential site in the local plan. 
uh, allocated site NP1. Uh, I will uh, show members um, some plans of the site and the allocation shortly. Um, so as I said, it's an outline application with all matters reserved. Although uh, presently the access to the site is from Newton Road, but the red line plan shows that the access will be through the neighbouring Barrett's development, which is presently uh, under construction. Uh, there are some heritage setting impacts in relation to Bats Coach House itself, which is listed as are the two adjoining buildings. So we've got some heritage setting issues. Um, I'll talk a little bit about phosphates. Um, we've got the general ecology considerations uh, and also uh, the site is subject to affordable housing and place based contributions as an allocated site. Uh, this is just a, a, a brief outline of the, the, the key policies which are in the report and specifically policy NP1. So the allocation seeks uh, approval for up approximately 230 new homes <clears throat> and as I'll explain shortly um, this is the uh, the last piece of the jigsaw in effect in in providing um, and fulfilling that that allocation so this is the inset map from the local plan of North Petherton and allocation NP1 is the large pink area at the southern end of the village I'll just zoom in on that so there we have it and if um, I'm not sure if members can see my cursor, uh, perhaps, yep. So that's the uh, that's the site here. Uh, these are the the list of buildings. This is the existing access, and then the the, the remainder of the allocation uh, already has uh, permission through three separate planning consents. I'll say a little bit more about that later on. So this is the the plan from uh, from the agenda, which shows a site and the access through the planned neighbouring Barrett's development. This is the red line boundary of the application site, which has been amended during the course of consideration um, to include the attenuation pond, which is part of the Barrett scheme, because this site will drain to that Barrett attenuation pond. Uh, the land in blue is also land. Uh, owned by the current applicant, which uh, which includes um, Bats Coach House listed dwelling there. So this is an illustrative layout of the site. As I said, the, the application is in outline with all matters reserved, um, but this is an illustration of how the site might be developed. Um, having said that, we don't support this layout. Uh, we don't think it's um, it pays sufficient regard to heritage setting impacts or the um, the layout and character of those listed buildings. But it does have a value, this illustrative plan, in that it indicates that the site is capable of accommodating seven units. Um, so the applications before committee, um, because the parish have objected on the grounds that they consider it might be an overdevelopment of the site, and uh, and on those heritage setting impacts. Um, but as I say, this is a purely illustrative layout. Um, the heritage officer is satisfied that the submitted heritage statement takes sufficient regard of heritage setting impacts. And this is quite a low density development. So normally you would expect density to be between 30 and 50 dwellings per hectare to make good use of land. This is a 28 dwellings per hectare, so it's it's sort of at the very lower end of what might be acceptable while still making good use of land. But what is clear that is that, that it's not an overdevelopment and having a density at that lower end of development does afford the opportunity um, to, to for more opportunity for consideration of those heritage setting impacts. So I'll just briefly show you um, some context. So here we have um, the uh, the three listed buildings and their curtilage, sort of generous curtilage. Uh, we've got the existing access, and then this is the application site, which is part an area of hard standing and two garage buildings, and then an area of paddock. This further area of paddock uh, to the rear, to the southwest, 
is what would be the the attenuation pond what is you know currently under construction as a att attenuation pond for the Barrett's development so these are the um the photographs showing um showing the access of the site out onto newton road which it won't form part of of, of this uh, this future development, but it will be retained as the access to the three listed buildings. And then these are the, just the, the close up photos of the smaller photographs you've seen. Uh, this next two photographs are photographs from within the site at, 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 the, at the gated entrance between the hard surface and area and the paddock area. So looking back towards the entrance, the current entrance, and you can see the listed wall uh the, the wall to the to the listed uh, the listed buildings and those listed buildings themselves and then there are the sort of close-ups of those photographs showing the context of the listed building quite a substantial um buttressed wall then this is from the site entrance uh pan and north showing that wall showing the garages and then panning back the other way from the site entrance looking southwest along the site towards the, the Barrett attenuation scheme currently under construction and then a close up of that attenuation scheme and you can see just to the right of, of that photograph with the attenuation pond you can see the um, the construction of the Barrett scheme uh, that was underway at the time those site visits uh, that site visit was undertaken and then some more photographs looking for uh, looking um, north and northwest across the site towards the Barrett scheme under construction. Uh, so there is a, 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 a phosphate issue, I said during the main considerations. Um, at the time the application was submitted, um, phosphate, phosphate was a concern. Um, it's now been established that this site doesn't drain to the Ramsar site. And so in effect, that problem has gone away. Um, and with drainage uh, being through the Barrett scheme, um there's no there's no problem that that is conditioned and um, we can make sure that those details of drainage are entirely acceptable when the reserve matters application is submitted so in conclusion uh, the principle of development is acceptable because it's part of an allocated site mp1 um, seven units provides an acceptable scheme it is low density and not an overdevelopment and so the, the, the parish con concerns can be addressed through reserve matters submission. Access through the Barrett scheme is entirely acceptable. Um, and when we get the reserve matters application in uh, for seven units, we can ensure that the, um, the heritage setting impacts are safeguarded. Uh, members should note that um, affordable housing and play space are to be secured through a unilateral undertaking. We've got a draft of that. Um, and uh, any resolution would be subject to that. So I do have one final slide uh, that I've just put on the end, just in case members wanted to see the context. Um, so this is um, this is the site here. Uh, this red line plan is the the approved Barrett scheme, uh, showing its attenuation pond to the south immediate southwest of the site, the access through out onto the main road. Um, this is the earlier phase uh, of Persimmon Homes, and there is a later approval for the for the completion of the MP1 allocation for um, for 33 homes here. So, in effect, this is the sort of last part of the jigsaw. As I said, um, it would be um, the, the 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 completion of the the allocation, and would secure a total of of over 200 200 homes. Um, that concludes um, my presentation, Chairman. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that members might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Kingham, you indicated. Um, regarding the, the phosphates, obviously this is a small site compared with the, the larger bit, which is surrounding it, which has all had uh, approval. Have they I sort of added on to the phosphates or is this because it's a, a small bit of land which is, comes under Ramsar? So uh, originally at, at the time of the allocation, um, the uh, the phosphates wasn't an issue. Uh, for the earlier phases of development, um, the, the, the original persimmon home scheme and then the, the Barrett's outline, 
again, phosphates wasn't a consideration. Barrett's trying to approve their drainage got caught by the Ramsar issue. Um, but we now um, we now understand that this site no longer it 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 it, it doesn't drain to the um, to the Ramsar catchment. So ostensibly, it's not an issue. Um, the applicants did do um, a phosphate calculation, and um, the these applicants owned all of the allocation and and of um, and have effectively sold the land, you know, to the other the other developers, and they have an agreement uh, with the developers that they can um, have access through the Barrett scheme and drain not only these seven properties but the existing three listed buildings which are on septic tank into into the Barrett's main drainage. So there's a, there's a, there's a, in a, in effect a net gain in terms of phosphates because you're taking three properties off septic tank. And, and into mains as well as these seven new ones. So ostensibly phosphates and drainage is, is 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 resolved and we can deal with that adequately through condition. Councillor King, you still happy? Could you oh no, I think you've got a mic, Councillor Evans. Thank you. Oh, is it my turn? It is. Oh, oh how exciting. Um yeah, first of all, I was quite surprised this was in NP1. Um, I thought it was just outside when when um, I first saw it, and um, it, 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 the, 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 what's actually in the local plan is an indicative plan rather than the actual the actual diagram that was shown on the on the on the thing. So so I stand corrected on that. Um, I I think when I looked at it, I, I you know unlike the town council, I'd rather it was six than seven, um, which is a little bit of a well we'll wait and see what the reserve matters will, will be like. Um, I think if it is to fit in with the heritage assets neighbouring it. It does. It does need some careful thought on the design, and I hope that that's that's taken into account. Um, can I check whether any construction access, and this may well be a reserve matters um, point, but any construction access through um, the access on from Bats Farm would cause considerable difficulty, mm -hmm. and I would hope that any all construction access can, comes through. Um, the Barrett's development rather than than this. Um, a, 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 a slight technical correction: the owners of the owners of the rest of the land didn't own all of the MP1 allocation. Hence, we had problems with bring it forward as 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 one one cohesive proposal. If only we could have done. Um, my last point is is around the foul drainage. Um, I was very surprised to learn that. Um, that Barrett's were, were, were pumping the foul drainage up to the top of Shovel Lane and then using, using the sewers down there. And I'm amazed that they're connecting through to this as well. Um, I just hope that that's not going to cause problems down the line. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Lloyd, is there anything you want to comment on? So, um, so um, although the the applicants have the um, have, have the right of connection um, because it's an outline application, drainage is conditioned, so you know there is an option to deal with you know the, the drainage on the site alone. But 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 the reality is um, that that it, it you know it 99.9 percent .9 certain it will be through the Barrett scheme, and, and obviously their drainage has to be um, the subject to a separate approval, and there is a current application for that at the moment, as I understand. Does that does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, that answers the question on the on on the on on the drainage, and, and I'll, I'll look forward to assurance on that when we have the reserve matters. Yeah. Um, would you be able just to, to clarify a little bit more on on how we're working with the developers on the heritage um, impacts of this? Yeah. Like you, when I look at the indicative plan, I'm like. That's more in keeping with the Barrett's home development, not in keeping with the heritage asset. Yeah. So, 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 what happened was this, this was the illustrative layout which accompanied the original application. Uh, the conservation officer uh, requested a, a heritage statement. Um, the heritage statement is now satisfied with, uh, and, and that and that will deal with those issues. And so, um, this illustrative layout. Um, sometimes an illustrative layout forms part of, of, an, of an approval of an outline application, but in this instance, we're not approving this plan, you know, uh, and actually, we're, you know, we're going further than that and saying through an informative that, you know, um, you know, we patently don't support this layout 
and that any reserve matters application would have to come forward paying due regard to the heritage statement and, and, and the heritage setting impact issues and obviously the conservation officer would be um, would be party to um, you know to commenting on, on on any future application and ideally you know through a through a pre-application if possible uh, on on that basis i'll move the officer recommendation um but would hope that the heritage implications are looked at very very carefully as i've been assured they will be i think one of the things is quite reassuring in that respect is is within the report i think it, it's very much given a steer that the conservation officer has has put in black and white that the lead the inspiration for this next phase needs to come from the heritage assets not from the new barrett estate next door which some other places have tried but um councillor hendry is that on it is yeah. um, i agree with heavily and councillor bill redden said in fact i couldn't put it better myself one last thing I say, can, can we minute that? Just yeah, yeah. That's... <laughs> okay, calm down, calm down, calm down. Uh, there's no mention of EV points unless I've missed something completely. And given today's petrol prices and diesel prices, wouldn't it be prudent just to ask them maybe, or just for goodwill, to to put in at least two two EV points there because it's it's the way forward nowadays, most certainly, but with rising prices, I just think it would be a good idea. That's all. Thank you. Fine. Mr. Lloyd. And secondly, I would, I'm quite happy to second councillor. <laughs> so so there, there, there is a condition. Um, if, if I can, um, if I can just find it. Um, 16, did you say? I think it might be condition 16. I've just been told by Mr. Noon. Thank, thank, thank you. Yes. So, so, so the, 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 those issues, the um, you know the, um, the the green credentials of the scheme will, will be addressed through through the reserve matters submission. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing any other indications from members. So we have a recommendation moved and seconded to grant permission. Those in favour, please show. That would again be unanimous. Yep, that's clearly carried unanimously. Right, members, if you could turn, that's the end of the applications before us. So if you turn to the reports in section 6.1, I think, Mr. Noon, you're just going to take us through these on page 61. Yep. OK, thank you. Um, appeals received. There's one at Clarks Road that was a very cramped form of uh, four dwellings that we just didn't feel could be fitted fitted into the space available, uh, given the proximity of the railway line and all sorts of other things. I think there was, I think the applicant managed to get more reasons for refusal on his second go than the first go. Dean was the case officer, uh, but a delegated refusal. Yes, it was a delegated refusal, a quite poor design. We felt in that case very cramped, um, you know, poor outlook, poor amenities for the future occupants. Um, we did encourage them a lesser form of development, maybe except for was it was a brownfield redevelopment. They rather took the appeal option, so we'll, we'll defend it as, as, as we will. Councillor Glassford, Councillor Glassford, if you could use, can, Alex, could you take the mic, otherwise no one else can hear. Sorry, is, is that the site of where the, where the corridor is? Corrugated green building is. Yeah, that's the one. It's an existing. It's like a leftover building from when they redeveloped the old Clark's factory, I think. And there's just this one unit left on the site. You no, know, it's not a particularly large unit. Um, you know, it's a. You know, he said, you know, there might be scope for one dwelling, maybe two. You know, they wanted four. They wanted six at one point, I think. Um, so. Okay, not seeing any further questions on that one. So the second one. Second one was a committee decision, agricultural workers dwelling. This was the one where we felt there'd been some double counting in the past with land being cited for two or three in total um, agricultural workers dwellings. Um, so that, that one is, is going to be quite an interesting one to defend because um, of what's gone on in the background. We'll be interested to see what the inspectors take on those if that sort of issue is. Okay, not seeing any comments or questions on that one, so over to 6.2. Um, so, yes, appeals are received, both dismissed. Um, character and appearance and impact on amenity were the issues at Dunkery Road. Oh, sorry. So, yes, yeah, so the first one, Dunkery Road, so, um, 
redevelopment for a single dwelling. Um, the, the inspector agreed with us on the, you know, the issues of character and appearance and amenity issues that it created. Uh, the other one at the uh, the Flower and Haynes site, I think members may be more familiar with that one. Um, that was two houses on the entrance as you come in, would have been on the right-hand side as you go in. I think they were felt to be the wrong design, creating a dead and um, passive street scene as you go into the development. Uh, there was a high wall around them. I think the design of the houses and the contribution they would have made to the street scene as you enter that development the inspector didn't like and also the impact on the adjoining property which is the fir the furs um, there would have been two houses and a parking area in between them and he felt that relationship was unacceptable thank you okay, not seeing any comments or questions so 6.3 certificates of lawfulness so uh certificate of lawfulness there so I have just continued occupancy and breach of an agricultural workers restriction. Um, these things crop up every so often. Um, so I think that one we felt the evidence that they had put in demonstrated they had breached uh, for 10 years at least and that they'd established the use there as an equestrian centre with um, a, a, a dwelling to go with it. Any comments or questions? No. OK, thank you very much. That, I think, brings us to the end of our agenda today. So thank you all very much, and we'll close the meeting. Thank you. Yeah.